This is the Lex Free Podcast, where we abridge the Lex Podcast with love by replacing everything Lex says with a pleasant guitar strum. Enjoy. It depends on what you mean by empathy. There are two, at least two kinds of empathy. There's the the cognitive form, which is, you know, I would argue even a species of, of reason. It's it's just understanding another person's point of view. You know, you understand why they're suffering or why they're happy or what, you know, we, we just, you have a theory of mind about another human being that is, is accurate. And so you can, you can navigate uh, in relationship to them more effectively. Um, and then there's an, another layer entirely, not incompatible with that, but just distinct, which is what people often mean by empathy, which is more, a kind of emotional contagion, right? Like you feel depressed and I begin to feel depressed along with you because, you know, it's just, it's contagious, right? I, I you know, we're so close and I'm, I'm so concerned about you and your problems become my problems and it bleeds through, right? Now, I think both of those capacities are very important, but um, the emotional contagion piece uh, and this is not really my thesis. This is something I, I have more or less learned from from Paul Bloom, um, the psychologist uh, who wrote a book on this topic titled "Against Empathy." Um, the emotional social contagion piece is a bad guide, rather often for ethical behavior and eth ethical intuitions. Oh it, boy! And uh, I'll, so I'll give you the, the the clear example of this, which is. Uh, I mean, we find stories with a single identifiable protagonist who we can effortlessly empathize with far more compelling than data, right? So if I tell you, you know, this is the, the classic case of, of the little girl who, who falls down a well, right? You know, this is some somebody's daughter. You see the parents uh, distraught on television. Uh, you hear her cries from the bottom of the well. The whole country stops. I mean, this, this was an example of this about, you know, 20, 25 years ago, I think, where it was just wall to wall on CNN. This is just the perfect use of CNN. It was, you know, 72 hours or whatever it was of continuous coverage of just extracting this girl from a well. So we effortlessly pay attention to that. We care about it. We will donate money toward it. I mean, it's just, it marshals 100% of our compassion and altruistic impulse. Um, Whereas if you hear that there's a genocide raging in some country you've never been to and never intended to go to, and the numbers don't make a dent, and the and we we find the story boring, right? And we'll change the channel in the face of a genocide, right? It doesn't matter. So the, it, it, and it literally, it, perversely, it could be five hundred thousand little girls have fallen down wells in that country, and we still don't care, right? So um, it's. Uh, you know, many of us have come to believe that this is a bug rather than a feature of our moral psychology. And so the, the, the empathy plays an unhelpful role there. So ultimately, I think when we're making big decisions about what we should do and how to mitigate human suffering and, and what's worth val valuing and how we should protect those values, um, I think reason is the better tool. But it's not that I would want to dispense with any part of empathy either. <music> Right. I'm not sure what the right answer is there, or, or even whether there is one right answer. There could be multiple, you know, peaks on on this part of the moral landscape. But so the the opposition is between an ethic that's articulated by you know, someone like the Dalai Lama, right? You know, or, or really any exponent of of um, you know classic Buddhism would say that you know, sort of the ultimate enlightened ethic is true dispassion with respect to friends and strangers, right? So that you would. The, you know the the mind of the Buddha would be truly dispassionate. You would love and, and care about all people equally, uh, and by that light, it seems some kind of ethical failing, or at least you know failure of of to fully actualize compassion in the limit, or you know enlightened wisdom in the limit, um, to care more or even and much more about your kids than the kids of other people, or and to, and to prioritize your your energy in that way, right? So you spend all this time trying to figure out how to keep your kids healthy and happy, and you'll attend to their minutest concerns, and however superficial. 
and and again, there's a genocide raging in Sudan or, or wherever, and it, it takes up less than 1% of your bandwidth. I'm not sure it would be a better world if everyone was running the, the Dalai Lama program there. I think some prioritization of, of one's nearest and dearest uh, ethically m- might be optimal because we, we'll all be doing that, and we'll all be doing that in a circumstance where we have certain norms and and laws and, and other structures that force us to be dispassionate where that matters, right? So like when I go to, when my daughter gets sick and I have to take her to, to a hospital, you know, I really want her to get attention, right? And I'm worried about her more than I'm worried about everyone else in the lobby. But the truth is I actually don't want a totally corrupt hospital. I don't want a hospital that treats my daughter better than anyone else in the lobby because she's my daughter and I've, you know, bribed the guy at the door or whatever, you know, or the guy's a fan of my podcast or whatever the thing is. You don't want starkly corrupt, unfair situations. And when you're, when you sort of get pressed down the hierarchy of Maslow's needs, you know, individually and, and, and societally, a bunch of the a bunch of those variables change, and they change for the worse, understandably. But yeah, when things are when everyone's corrupt and it's you're you're in a in a state of of uh, collective emergency, you know, you've got a lifeboat problem. You're scrambling to get into the lifeboat. Yeah, then then fairness and norms and and um, the you know the, uh, the other vestiges of civilization begin to get stripped off. We can't reason from those emergencies to normal life. I mean, in normal life, we want justice, we want fairness, we want, we're all better off for it, even when the spotlight of our concern is focused on the people we know, the people who are friends, the people who are family, people we, we, we have good reason to care about. We still, by default, want a system that protects the, the interests of strangers, too. And, and we know that, generally speaking, and just in, in game theoretic terms, we're all gonna to tend to be better off in a fair system than a corrupt one. I think it's important, but I just, it only takes you so far, right? It doesn't, it doesn't get you to truth, right? It's not, it, it, truth is not a, uh, it's not decided by, uh, you know, democratic principles. And um, certain people believe things for understandable reasons, but those reasons are nonetheless bad reasons. Right, they, they don't scale. They don't generalize. They're not reasons anyone should adopt for themselves or or respect, you know, epistemologically. And yet, their their circumstance is understandable, and it's something you can care about, right? And so, yeah, like I mean, just take. I think there's many examples of this that you might be thinking of, but I mean, one one that comes to mind is I've I've been super critical of Trump, obviously, and. Um, I've been super critical of certain people for endorsing him or not criticizing him when he really made it, you know, patently obvious who he was. You know, if if there had been any doubt initially, there was no doubt when we have a sitting president who's not uh, not um, agreeing to a, a peaceful transfer of power, right? So, um, I'm I'm critical of all of that, and yet the fact that many millions of Americans didn't see what was wrong with Trump or bought into the, um, didn't see through his con, right? I mean, they bought into the idea that he was a, a brilliant businessman who could, might just be able to change things because he's so unconventional and so, you know, his heart is in the right place. You know, he's really a man of the people, even though he's a, you know, gold-plated everything in his life. Um, they bought the myth somehow uh, of, you know, the, largely because they had seen him on television for almost a decade and a half, uh, pretending to be this genius businessman who could get things done. Um, It's understandable to me that many very frustrated people who have not had their hopes and dreams actualized, uh, who have been the victims of globalism and and, uh, many other current trends, it's understandable that they would be confused and 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 not see the liability of electing a grossly incompetent 
morbidly narcissistic person I- into the into the in the presidency. Um, so I don't. So w- which is to say that I don't blame. There are many many millions of people who I don't necessarily blame for the Trump phenomenon. I, but I can nonetheless bemoan the phenomenon as as indicative of you know very bad uh, state of affairs in our society. Right. So it's it's there's two levels to it. I mean, one is I think you have to call a spade a spade when you're talking about how things actually work and what things are are likely to happen or not. But then you can recognize that people are have very different life experiences and and yeah, I mean I think empathy and you know, probably the better word for what I w- would hope to embody there is compassion, right? Like really, you know, you, to really wish people well, you know, and to really wish you know strangers well, effortlessly wish them well. I mean, to realize that you, there is no opposition between in the at bottom, there's no real opposition between selfishness and selflessness because wise selfishness really takes into account other people's happiness. I mean, you what you know, which do you do you want to live in a society where you have everything, but most other people have nothing? Uh, or do you want to live in a society where you're surrounded by happy, creative, self-actualized people who are having their hopes and dreams realized? I think it's obvious that the, the second society is much better, however much you can guard your good luck. I agree with the first part. So I, I haven't bought the myth that it's... Uh, you know, a truly representative democracy in, in the way that we would you know, might idealize. Um, and, uh, you know, on some level, I mean, this is a different conversation, but on some level, I'm not even sure how much I think it should be, right? Like, I, I'm not sure uh, we want, in the end, everyone's opinion g- given equal weight about, you know, just what we should do about anything. And I include myself in that. I mean, there are many topics around which I don't deserve to have a strong opinion because I don't know what I'm talking about, right? Or what I would be talking about if I had a strong opinion. So, um, and I think we'll probably get to that, to some of those topics because I've declined to have certain conversations on my podcast just because I think I'm the wrong person to have that conversation, right? And and it's um, and I think it's important to see those bright lines in in one's life and in in the moment politically. Uh, and ethically, um, so yeah, I think. Um, so leave aside the the, the viability of democracy. Uh, but I, I'm I'm under no illusions that all of our institutions are you know worth preserving pre- precisely as they have been up until the moment this great orange wrecking ball came swinging through our lives. But I just it was a very bad bet to elect someone who is grossly incompetent and. Um, wor- worse than incompetent, um, genuinely malevolent in his selfishness, right? And, I th- and, and this is something we know based on literally decades of him being in the public eye, right? He's not as he's not a public servant in any normal sense of that term, and he couldn't possibly give an honest or sane answer to the question the question you asked me about empathy and reason and. And like, how should we, you know, what, what should guide us? Um, I, I genuinely think he is missing some necessary moral and and psychological uh, tools, right? And, and this this is, I can feel com- compassion for him as a human being to, because I think having those things is incredibly important, and genuinely loving other people is incredibly important, and and knowing what all that's about is 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 that's really the good stuff in life. And I I um I think he's missing a lot of that. But I think we we don't want to promote people to to the highest positions of power in our society who are far outliers in in pathological terms, right? We want them to be far outliers in in if if in the best case in wisdom and compassion and some of the things you've some of the topics you've brought up. I mean, we want someone to be deeply informed. We want someone to be. Um, uh, unusually curious, unusually alert to how they may be wrong or getting things wrong consequentially. Um, he's none of those things. And if, in, insofar as we're going to get normal mediocrities in that role, which I think you know is often the best we could expect, let's get normal mediocrities in that role, not uh, you know, once in a generation 
uh, narcissists and um, uh, frauds. I mean, it's like the. I mean, just take honesty as a single variable, right? I, I think you want. Yeah, yes, it's possible that uh, you know, most politicians lie at least some of the time. Uh, I don't think that's a good thing. Um, I think people should be gen, you know, generally honest, um, even to a fault. Um, yes, there are certain circumstances where lying, I think, is necessary. It's, it's kind of on a continuum of self-defense and and violence. So it's like if you're gonna, you know, if the Nazis come to your door and ask you if you've got Anne Frank in the attic, I think it's okay to lie to them. Um, but uh, you know, Trump, there's, I arguably, there's never been a person in that anyone could name in, in human history who's lied with, the, with that kind of velocity. Um, I mean, it's just, it was, he was a, just a blizzard of lies, great and small, you know, to, to pointless and, and to, and effective, but it's just, it, it says something, uh, fairly alarming about our society that a person of that character got promoted. And so, uh, yes, I have compassion and concern for, for half of the society who didn't see it that way. And that's going to sound elitist and, and, uh, and smug or something to, for anyone who's, who's on that side listening to me. But, um, it's genuine. I mean, I'm, I understand that like, like I barely have the, I'm like one of the luckiest people in the world and I barely have the bandwidth to pay attention to half the things I should pay attention to in order to have an opinion about half the things we're going to talk about. Right. So how much less bandwidth is somebody who's working two jobs or, you know, a single mom who's, who's, you know, tr tr raising, you know, multiple kids, you know, even a single kid. It's just, it's unimaginable to me that people have the, the bandwidth to, to really track this stuff. And so then they jump on social media and they, they see, they get inundated by misinformation and they see what their favorite influencer just said, um, and now they're worried about vaccines and they're, it's, it's just, it's, we're living in an environment where our, our, in, the information space has become so corrupted uh, and we've built machines to, to further corrupt it. You know, I mean, we've built a business model for the internet that further corrupts it. Uh, so it's, it is just, um, it's chaos in informational terms. And I don't fault people for being confused and impatient and uh at the at their wits end and um yes trump was a an enormous fuck you to the establishment and that, and that's that was understandable for many reasons yeah yeah medical well, so medical I, my, condition yeah I, I, mean, I think trump derangement syndrome is a is a very clever meme because it it just uh, throws the you know the, the problem back on the person who's criticizing Trump, but sure. the, in truth, the the true Trump derangement syndrome was not to have seen how dangerous and divisive it would be to promote someone like Trump to that position of power, and to not and in the in the the final moment, not to see how uh, untenable it was to still support someone who, uh, you know, a, pr a sitting president who was not committing to a peaceful transfer of power. I mean, that was, if, if, if that wasn't a bright line for you, you have been deranged by something uh, because that was, you know, the, that was one minute to midnight for our democracy as far as, far as I, I'm concerned. And I think it really was, but for the, the integrity of uh, a few people that we didn't suffer some real constitutional crisis and, and real emergency, you know, after January 6th. I mean, if, if Mike Pence had caved in and decided to not certify the election, right? Uh, if it, if it, literally, you can count on two hands the number of people who held things together at that moment. And so, and it, was, so it wasn't for want of trying on Trump's part that we, we um, didn't succumb to some, you know, real, it, truly uncharted uh, uh, catastrophe with our democracy. So the fact that that didn't happen is not a sign that those of us who were worried that it was so close to happening were exaggerating the problem. I mean, it's like, you know, you almost got run over by a car, but you didn't. And so, you know, you're, the fact that you're adrenalized and you're thinking, you know, oh boy, that was dangerous. I probably shouldn't, you know, you know, wander in the middle of the street, uh, with my eyes closed. Um, you weren't wrong. 
to feel that you really had a problem, right? Um, and came very close to something truly uh, terrible. So I, th I think that's where we were, and I think we shouldn't do that again, right? So the fact that he's he's still he's coming back around as potentially a viable candidate, you know, I'm not spending much time thinking about it, frankly, because it's you know I'm I'm waiting for the moment where it it, re it requires some thought. Um, I mean, they, it, it did. It took up. Uh, I don't know how many podcasts I devoted to the topic. It wasn't that. I mean, it wasn't that many in the end. You know, against the the number of podcasts I I devoted to other topics. But there are people who look at Trump and just find him funny, entertaining, not especially threatening. It's like not a you know just it's just good fun to see somebody who's like who's just not taking anything seriously, and it's just just putting a you know a stick in the wheel of of business as usual again and again and again and again. Um, and they don't really see anything at, much at stake, right? It doesn't really, doesn't really matter if we don't support NATO. It doesn't really matter if he says he trusts Putin more than our intelligence services. Uh, I mean, none of this, is, it doesn't matter if he's uh, on the one hand saying that he loves uh, the leader of North Korea and on the other threatening, threatens to, to you know, bomb them back to the Stone Age, right, on Twitter. It's all. It all can be taken in the spirit of kind of reality television. It's like this is just this is the part of the movie that's just fun to watch, right? And I understand that. I can even inhabit that space for a few minutes at a time. But there's the deeper concern that we're in the process of entertaining ourselves to death, right? That we're just not taking things seriously. And this is it's a problem I've had with several other people we might name who just who just appear to me to be goofing around at scale and they lack a kind of moral seriousness i mean they're, they're touching big problems where lives hang in the balance but they're just fucking around and i think they're really important problems that we have to get our heads straight around and we need you know it's not to say that that institutions don't become corrupt i, I think they do and i think and i'm quite worried that you know both about the the, the loss of trust in our institutions and the the fact that trust has eroded for good reason, right? That they have become less trustworthy. I, I, I you know, they've become infected by, you know, political ideologies that are not truth tracking. I mean, I, I worry about all of that, um, but I just think the we need institutions. We need to rebuild them. We need we need experts who are real experts. We need to value expertise over you know, amateurish speculation and conspiracy thinking and just, you know, and bullshit. The kind of amateur speculation we're doing on this very podcast. <laughs> I'm usually alert to the moments where I'm just guessing or where I actually feel like I'm talking from within my wheelhouse. And I try to telegraph that a fair amount with people. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, but it's it's not... It's different. Like, I mean, you, you can invite someone onto your podcast who's an expert about something that you're you you're not an expert about, and then you you in the process of getting more informed yourself, your your audience is getting more informed. So you're asking smart questions, and you might be pushing back at the margins, but you know that when push comes to shove on that topic, you really don't have a basis to have a a, a strong opinion, and if you were going to form a, a a a strong opinion that was this counter to the expert you have in front of you, it's going to be by deference to some other expert who you've brought in or who you've heard about or whose work you've you've read or whatever. But there, there's a paradox to how we value authority in science that most people don't understand, and I think we should at some point unravel that because it's it's the basis for a lot of public confusion, and and for, frankly, it's the basis for a lot of you know, criticism I've received on these topics, where it's, you know, people think that I'm a, you know, I, I'm against free speech or I'm an establishment shill, or it's, it's like, I just think you know, I'm a creden credentialist. I just think people with PhDs from I Ivy League universities should, you know, run everything. It's not true, but there's a ton of, conf there's, there's a lot to cut through to get to daylight there because people are um, very confused about how we value authority in the service of rationality generally. 
once in a generation narcissist. No, I, I don't think he's he's a a truly scary, sinister, you know, Putin like or you know Hitler, much less Hitler like figure. Not at all. I mean, he's not ideological. He doesn't care about anything beyond himself. So it's not. Um, no, no, he's much less scary than any really scary, you know, totalitarian, right? I mean, and, and he's... He's more brave new world than 1984. This is what, you know, Eric Weinstein never stops um, badgering me about, but, you know, he's still wrong, Eric. Um, you know, I, I can, you know, my, my analogy for Trump was that he's an evil Chauncey Gardner. I don't know if you remember the, 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 um, the, the book or the film Being There uh, with, with Peter Sellers. Um, but, you know, Peter Sellers is this gardener who really doesn't know anything, um, but he gets recognized as this wise man and gets promoted to immense power in, in Washington because he's speaking in these kind of, in a, in a semblance of wisdom. He's got these very simple aphorisms or what seem to be aphorisms. He's just talking, all he cares about is gardening. He's just talking about his garden all the time. Yeah. But, you know, he'll say something, but, yeah, you know, in the spring, you know, the new shoots will will bloom. And people read into that some kind of genius, you know, insight politically. And so he gets promoted. And so that's the, that's the joke of the film. For me, Trump has always been someone like an evil Chauncey Gardner. I mean, he's, he's, it's not to say he's totally, in, he, yes, he has a certain kind of genius. He's got a genius for creating a spectacle around himself, right? He's got a genius for getting the, the eye of the media always coming back to him. Um, but it, it it's only, it's a kind of, it's a kind of you know self promotion that only works if you actually are truly shameless and don't care about having a reputation for anything that 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 I or you would want to have a reputation for, right? It's like it's pure the pure pornography of attention, right? He j and he just wants more of it. Um, I think the truly depressing and genuinely scary thing was that we have a country that at least half of the country, given how. Uh, a, a, broken our society is in many ways, we have a country that didn't see anything wrong with that, bringing someone who's, uh, who obviously doesn't know what he should know to be president, and who's obviously not a good person, right? Who obviously doesn't care about people, can't even pretend to care about people really, right, in a credible way. Um, and so, I mean, this if there's a silver lining to this, it it's it's along the lines you just sketched. It shows us how vulnerable our system is to a truly brilliant and sinister figure, right? I mean, like I I think we are um, we really dodged a bullet. Yes, yeah, someone far more competent and conniving and ideological could have exploited our system in a way that Trump didn't, and I, and that's um, yeah. So if if we plug those holes eventually, um, that would be a good thing and he would have done a good thing for our society, right? I mean, one of the things we realized, and I, I think nobody knew, I mean, I certainly didn't know it and I didn't hear anyone talk about it, is how much our system relies on norms rather than laws. Yeah, civility right? almost. Yeah, it's just like, it's, it's quite possible that he never did anything illegal. You know, truly, truly illegal. I mean, I think he probably did a few illegal things, but like illegal such that he really should be thrown in jail for it. You know, um, at least that remains to be seen. So all of the chaos, all of the you know, all of the diminishment of our stature in the world, all of the just the the opportunity costs of spending years focused on nonsense. Um, all of that was just norm violations. All of that was just that was just all a matter of not saying the thing you should say. But that doesn't mean they're insignificant, right? It's not that it's like it's not illegal for a sitting president to say, "No, I'm not going to commit to a peaceful transfer of power." Right? We'll wait and see whether I win. If I win, it it it, it, it was the election was 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 valid. If I lose, it was fraudulent. Right. <laughs> That wasn't a humorous perturbation because he did everything he could. Granted, he wasn't very competent, but he did everything he could to try to steal the election. I mean, the irony is 
He claimed to have an election stolen from him, all the while doing everything he could to steal it, declaring it fraudulent in advance, trying to get the votes to, 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 to not be counted as the evening wore on, knowing that they were going to be disproportionately Democrat, Democrat votes um, because of the, the you know, because of the position he took on mail-in ballots. I mean, all of it was fairly calculated. Um, the whole circus of, 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 you know, the clown car uh, that crashed into, you know, Four Seasons Landscaping, right? And, and you got Rudy Giuliani with his hair dye, and you got Sidney Powell and all, all these uh, grossly incompetent people lying as freely as they could breathe about election fraud, right? And all of these things are getting thrown out by, you know, Republican, largely Republican election officials and Republican judges. Um, it wasn't wasn't for want of trying that he didn't maintain his power in this country. He really tried to steal the presidency. He just was not competent. And the people around him weren't competent. So that's a good thing. And it's worth not letting that happen again. But he tried to do things, and he would have to have done those things through other people, and there are people who refused to do those things. There are people who said they would quit. They would, they would quit publicly, right? I mean, this you, you start, again, there are multiple books written about uh, all, you know, the, the last hours of, of this presidency, and the details are shocking in what he tried to do and tried to get others to do, and it's awful, right? I mean, it's, it's just awful that we were that close to something, um, to, to a true unraveling of our political process. I mean, it's the only time in our lifetime that anything like this has happened. And um, it was deeply embarrassing, right, for, uh, to, you know, on the world stage. It's just like we, we looked like a banana republic there for a while. And we're the, the lone superpower. It's a bit, it's, it's not good, right? And, and so we shouldn't. Like, there's no, there's no. The I, the people who thought, well, we just need to shake things up, and this is a great, inst- great way to shake things up. And having people, you know, storm our capital and you know, smear shit on the walls, that's just more shaking things up, right? Uh, it's all just for the lulls. Um, there's a nihilism and cynicism to all of that, which, again, in certain people, it's understandable. You know, frankly, it's not understandable if you've got a billion dollars and you're you you know have a compound in Menlo Park or wherever it's like the, the, there are people who are cheerleading this stuff who shouldn't be cheerleading this stuff and who know that they can get on their Gulf Stream and fly to their compound in New Zealand if everything goes to shit right so it, there, there's a cynicism to all of that that I think we should be deeply critical of I don't think there is something profitably to be said to someone who's truly captivated by the, the the personality cult of Trumpism, right? Like, there's nothing that I'm going to say to, there's no conversation I'm going to have with Candace Owens, say, about Trump that's going to converge on something reasonable, right? You there, don't think so? No, I mean, I've tried, I haven't tried with Candace, but I've tried with, you know, many people who are in that particular orbit. I mean, I, I've, I've had conversations with people who won't admit that there's anything wrong with Trump anything yeah, but he has so few of them he has fewer good but, qualities than any virtually anyone i can name right but, but so he he's funny he I'll, I'll grant you that he's funny he's he's a, he's a good entertainer there's he, others look at just policies and actual impacts he I, had. I've, I've admitted that no no so like so i've admitted that many of his policies i agree with many many of his policies. i mean so it, Probably more often than not, I mean, at least on balance, I agreed. So I, I agreed with his policy that you know we should take China seriously as an adversary, right? And, we were, and um, I think, I mean, again, you have to. There's a lot of fine print to a lot of this because the way he talks about these things and and many of his motives that are obvious are, are things that I um, don't support. But I mean, take immigration. I think there's it's obvious that we should have control of our borders. Right, like I, I don't see the argument for not having control of our borders. We should let in who we want to let in, and we should keep out who we want to keep out, and we should have a sane immigration policy. So um, I don't, I didn't necessarily think it was a priority to build the wall, but I didn't, I never criticized the impulse to build the wall because if 
you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people are coming across that border and we are not in a position to know who's coming, that seems untenable to me. So, um, and I can recognize that many people in our society are on balance the victims of immigration. Because, and, and, and there is, a, in, in, in many cases, a zero-sum contest between the interests of actual citizens and the interests of immigrants, right? So I think we should have a we should have control of our borders. We should have a sane and compassionate immigration policy. We should have we should let in refugees, right? So I did, you know Trump on refugees was terrible, um, but no, like I would say eighty percent of the policy concerns people uh, celebrated in him are concerns that I either share entirely or certainly sympathize with. Right. So like that's not that's not the issue. The issue is a threat to democracy in some fundamental well, it, way. It, the issue is largely what you said it was. It, it's not so much the person, it's the effect on everything he touches. Right. He just he has this this superpower of deranging and destabilizing uh almost everything he touches and sullying the and, and compromising the integrity of almost anyone who comes into his orbit. I mean, so you looked at these people who served you know, as his chief of staff or you know, in various cabinet positions, people who had real reputations you know, for, for probity and, and level-headedness, uh, you know, whether you shared their politics or not. I mean, these were real people. These were not, you know, some of them were goofballs, but um, uh, you know, many people who, who just got totally trashed by proximity to him and then trashed by him when they finally parted company with him. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just people bent over backwards to accommodate his norm violations, and it it was um, it was bad for them, and it was bad for our 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 system. Um, and but that but none of that discounts the fact that we have um, a system that really needs a proper house cleaning. Yes, there are bad incentives and um, entrenched interests, and yeah, I'm not a fan of the concept of of the deep state, uh, but because it you know has been so propagandized. But yes, there's there's something like that you know that is uh, not um, flexible enough to re- to respond intelligently to the needs of the moment, right? So there's a lot of rethinking of government and of institutions in general that I think. You know, we should do, but we need smart, w- well-informed, well-intentioned people to do that job. And the well-intentioned part is is hugely important, right? It's just, I mean, just give me someone who is not the most selfish person anyone has ever heard about in their lifetime, right? And what we got with Trump was that, like, the, literally the one most selfish person I think anyone could name. I mean, and you, and again, you, there's so much known about this man. That's the thing. It's like it predates his presidency. We knew this guy 30 years ago, and and this and this is why to come back to the, the those inflammatory comments about Hunter Biden's laptop. The reason why I can say with confidence that I don't care what was on his his laptop is that there is and and that includes any evidence of corruption on the, on the part of his father, right? Now, there's been precious little of that that's actually emerged. So it's like, there is no, as far as I can tell, there's not a big story associated with that laptop as much as people bang on about a, a few emails. But even if there were just obvious corruption, right? Like Joe Biden was at this meeting and he took you know this amount of money from this shady guy uh, for bad reasons, right? Given how visible the lives of these two men have been, right? I mean, given how much we know about Joe Biden and how much we know about Donald Trump and how they have lived in public for almost as long as I've been alive, both of them, the 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 scale of corruption can't possibly balance out between the two of them, right? We, I, if if you show me that Joe Biden has this secret life where he's driving a Bugatti and he's living like Andrew Tate, right, and he's do he's doing all these things I didn't know about. Okay, then I'm going to start getting a sense that all right, maybe this guy is way more corrupt than I realized. Maybe there is some deal in Ukraine or with China that is just 
Like this guy is not who he seems. He's not the public servant he's been pretending to be. He's been on the take for decades and decades, and he's just he's as dirty as can be. He's he's all mobbed up, and it's a nightmare. Um, and he can't be trusted, right? That's possible if you show me that his life is not at all what it seems. But on the assumption that I, having looked at this guy for literally decades, right, and ha and knowing that every journalist has looked at him for decades. Just how many affairs is he having? Just how much, you know, uh, how many drugs is he doing? How many houses does he have? Where, you know, what, 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 what is, what are the obvious conflicts of interest? You know, you hold that against what we know about Trump, right? And I mean, the litany of indiscretions you can put on Trump's side that, that testify to his cor personal corruption, to testify to the fact that he has no ethical compass there's simply no comparison, right? So that's why I don't care about what's on the laptop. When Now, if you tell me Trump is no longer running for president in 2024, and we can put Trumpism behind us, and now you're saying, listen, there's a lot of stuff on that laptop that makes Joe Biden look like a total asshole. Okay, I'm all ears, right? I mean, it, it was a forced, in 2020, it was a forced choice between a sitting president who wouldn't commit to a peaceful transfer of power and a guy who's obviously too old to be president, who has a crack addicted son, who who you know who lost his laptop, and I just knew that I was going to take Biden in spite of whatever litany of horrors was going to come tumbling out of that laptop. So but that, yeah, <laughs> but but it's not just superficial. It is when you. When someone only wants wealth and power and fame, that's, that's, that is their, their their objective function, right? They're like a, like a a robot that is calibrated just to those variables, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and they don't care about the risks we run on any other front. They don't care about I mean, environmental risk, pandemic risk, nuclear proliferation risk, none of it, right? They just they're just tracking fame and money and and whatever can can personally uh redound to their self-interest along those lines and they're not informed about the other risk we're running really i mean in trump you you had a president who was repeatedly asking his generals why couldn't we use our nuclear weapons why can't we have more of them why do i have fewer nuclear weapons than jfk right as though that were a sign of 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 uh, anything other than progress right um and this is the guy who's got the, the 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 button, right? I mean, he's got he, somebody's following him around with a bag, waiting to take his order to to launch, right? Um, that is a. It's just it, it's a it's a a risk we should never run. One thing Trump has going for him, I think, is that he's he doesn't drink or do drugs, right? Although there's you know people allege that he does speed, but um, you know let's take him at his word. He's he's. Uh, not deranging himself with with pharmaceuticals, at least, but um, apart from Diet Coke. Uh, I like. I, I hope. I hope you're right. Um, yeah, I mean, everything you said about the military industrial complex is true, right? And and it's been we've been worrying about that on both sides of the aisle for a very long time. I mean, that's just you know, that phrase came from from Eisenhower. Um, it's, uh, I mean, so much of what ails us is a story of bad incentives, right? And bad incentives are so powerful that they corrupt even good people, right? How much more do they corrupt bad people, right? Like, so it's like you want to, at minimum, you want reasonably good people, at least non-pathological people in a, in the system trying to navigate against the grain of bad incentives and better still all of us can get together and, and try to diagnose those incentives and change them right and 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 we will really succeed when we have a system of incentives where the the good incentives are so strong that even bad people are effortlessly behaving as though they're good people because they're so successfully incentivized to behave that way, right? That's, you know, and so, so it's, it's almost the inversion of our current situation. So yes, 
And you say I changed my mind about the war. Uh, I, not quite. I mean, I, I was never a, a supporter of the war in Iraq. I was always worried that it was a, a distraction from the war in Afghanistan. I was a supporter of the war in Afghanistan. And I will admit, in hindsight, that looks like, uh, you know, at best a highly ambiguous and painful exercise, you know, pro more likely a, a fool's errand, right? It's like that, you know, it did not turn out well. It's, it's, it wasn't for want of trying. I, I don't, you know, I, I have not done a deep dive on, on all of the failures there. And maybe all of these failures are failures in principle. I mean, maybe it's just, maybe that's not the kind of thing that can be done well by anybody, whatever our intentions. Um, but yeah, the, the move to Iraq always seemed questionable to me. And um, when we knew the problem, the immediate problem at that moment, you know, Al-Qaeda uh, uh, was in Afghanistan and, you know, and then bouncing to Pakistan. Um, anyway, all, you know, so yes, but I, my, my, my sense of the possibility of nation building, my sense of, of, um, you know, in so in so far as the 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 neocon um, spirit of of uh, you know responsibility and idealism that you know America was the kind of nation that should be functioning in this way as as the world's cop, and we got we have to get in there and and untangle some of these knots by force um, uh, rather often because you know if we don't do it over there, we're going to have to do it over here, kind of thing. Um, yeah, some of that has definitely changed for me in my thinking. I mean, there are obviously cultural reasons why it failed in Afghanistan, and, and if you can't change the culture, um, it's uh, you're not going to force a change at gunpoint in, in the culture. Or it certainly seems that that's not going to happen. And it took us, you know, over twenty years to apparently to realize that. Mm -hmm. Well, also there there are signs of it working too. You have all the stories of girls now going to school, right? You know, the girls are getting battery acid thrown in their faces by religious maniacs, and then we come in there and we stop that. And now girls are getting educated, and there's a I mean, and that's all good, and our intentions are good there. And I mean, we're on the right side of history there. Good girls should be going to school. You know, Malala Yousafzai should have the Nobel Prize, and she shouldn't have been shot in the face by by the Taliban, right? Um, we know what the right answers are there. The question is, what do you do when there are enough, in this particular case, religious maniacs who are willing to die and let their children die in defense of crazy ideas and moral norms that belong in the seventh century? Um, and it's a problem we couldn't solve, and we couldn't solve it even though we spent you know, trillions of dollars to solve it. Well, I, I think it always will be, or you know, in the absence of perfect AI, it, it always will be. And this becomes relevant with AI as well. Yeah. Because there's yeah, yeah. some censorship on AI happening. Yeah. And it's an interesting question there as well. I don't think Twitter is as important as people think it is, right? And and I I used to think it was more important when I was on it, and now that I'm off of it, I think it's, it's uh, I mean, first let me say it's just a, a, an unambiguously good thing in my experience to delete your Twitter account, right? It's like, it, it is just, even the good parts of Twitter that I miss were bad in the aggregate, in the, in the, the degree to which it was fragmenting my attention, the degree to which my life was getting doled out to me in periods between yeah. those moments where I checked Twitter, right? And had my attention diverted. And, and I was, you know, I was not a, a, a crazy Twitter addict. I mean, I was a, I, I was probably a pretty normal user. I mean, I was not someone who was tweeting multiple times a day or even every day, right? I mean, I, would, I probably, I think I probably averaged something like one tweet a day, I think I averaged. But in reality, it was like, you know, there'd be like four tweets one day and then I wouldn't tweet for you know, the better part of a week. And But I was looking a lot because it was my newsfeed. I was just following, you know, 200 very smart people and I would just wanted to see what they were paying attention to. And I would, they would recommend articles and I would read those articles. And, and then when I would read an article that then I would, that I would thought I should signal boost, I would tweet. And so all of that seemed good. And it, like, that's all separable 
from all of the odious bullshit that came back at me in, in response to this, you know, largely in response to this Hunter Biden thing. Um, but even the good stuff has a downside. And, and, it, and it comes at just this point of your phone is this perpetual stimulus of, um, which is intrinsically fragmenting of time and attention. And now my phone is is a much less of a presence in my life. And it's it's not that I don't check Slack or check email. I mean, I, you know, I, I use it to work, but um, my sense of just what the world is and my sense of my place in the world, the sense of where I exist as a person has changed a lot by deleting my Twitter account. I mean, I had a, you know, and it's just, it's um and the, and the things that I think I mean we all know this phenomenon I mean, we, we, we say of someone you know, that person's too online right like what does it mean to be too online um, and where do you draw the that that boundary you know where, where how do you know what, what constitutes being too online well in some sense just be I think being on on social media at all is to be too online I mean g- given what it does to given the kinds of information it it um, signal boosts, and given the um, given the impulse it kindles in each of us to reach out to our audience in at, at, in specific mo- moments and in specific ways, right? It's like there there are lots of moments now where I have an opinion about something, but there's nothing for me to do with that opinion, right? Like there's no Twitter, right? So like there, there are lots of things that I would have tweeted mm-hmm. in the last months that are not the kind of thing I'm going to do a podcast about. I'm not going to roll out 10 minutes on that topic on my podcast. I'm not going to take the time to really think about it. But had I been on Twitter, I would have reacted to this thing in the news or this thing that some somebody did, right? What do you do with that thought now? I just let go of it. Like it, chocolate ice cream is the most delicious thing yeah, ever. Yeah, it's, it's usually not that sort of thing. But it's it's just... But then you look at the kinds of problems people create for themselves. You look at the life deranging and reputation destroying things that people do and and i look at the things that that have the analogous things that have happened to me i mean the things that have really bent my life around professionally over the past you know decade so much of it is twitter i mean it, honestly in my case almost a hundred percent of it was twitter the, the controversies i would get into the things I, w- I would think i would have to respond to in a pod like i would release a podcast on a certain topic I would see some blowback on Twitter. You know, it would give me the sense that there was some signal that I really had to respond to. Now that I'm off Twitter, I, I recognize that most of that was just, t- it was totally specious, right? It was, it was not something I had to respond to. But yet I would then do a cycle of podcasts responding to that thing, that like mm-hmm. t- taking my foot out of my mouth or taking someone else's foot out of my mouth. And it became this this self-perpetuating uh, cycle, which, I mean, it's, you know, if you're having fun, great. I mean, if, if it's, if it's, if it's generative of useful information and, and engagement professionally and, and psychologically, great. But, and, and there, you know, there was some of that on Twitter. I mean, there were people who I've connected with because, because I just, you know, one, one of us DM'd the other on Twitter and it was hard to see how that was going to happen. Mm-hmm otherwise but it was um largely just a machine for manufacturing unnecessary controversy yeah but it's it's not the way i wanted to use it it's not the way it it it, sure. it, it promises itself as as a you wanted to have debate i wanted to and... actually communicate with people yeah i want i wanted to hear from the person because the, again, it's it's like being in Afghanistan, right? It's like there 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 are the the potted cases where it's obviously good, right? It's like in Afghanistan, the girl who's getting an education that is just here. That's why we're here. That's that's obviously good. I have those moments on Twitter where it's like, okay, I'm hearing from a smart person who's detected an error I made in my podcast mm-hmm. or in a book, or they've just got some great idea about something that I should spend time on. And I would never have heard from this person in any other format. And now I'm actually in dialogue with them. And it's, it's fantastic. That's the promise of it, to actually talk to people. And so I, I kept getting lured back into that. Um, 
no the the way the sane or you know sanity preserving way of of using it is is just as a marketing channel you just put your stuff out there and you don't look at what's coming back at you um and that's you know for you know i'm on other social media platforms that i don't even touch i mean my team put post stuff on facebook and on mm -hmm. instagram i never even see what's on there so you don't think it's possible to see something and not let it affect your mind no that, that's definitely possible but the question is and i did that for vast stretches of time right and but then the the promise of the platform is dialogue and feedback right, right. so like so why am i if i know for whatever reason i'm going to see like 99 to 1 awful feedback you know yeah. bad faith feedback malicious feedback some of it's probably even bots and i'm not even aware of who's a person who's a bot right but i'm just going to stare into this funhouse mirror of acrimony and dishonesty um that is going to, I mean, the the, th the reason why I got off is not because I couldn't recalibrate and, and, and find equanimity again with all the, 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 the nastiness that was coming back at me, and not that I couldn't ignore it for vast stretches of time, but I could see that I kept coming back to it, hoping that it would be something that I could use, a real yeah. tool for communication. And I was noticing that it was insidiously changing the way I felt about people, yeah. both people I know and people I don't know, right? Like people I, you know, mutual friends of ours who are behaving in certain ways on Twitter, which just seem insane to me. Uh, and then I, that became a signal I felt like I had to take into account somehow, right? You're seeing people at their worst, both friends and strangers. Um, and I, I felt that it was as much as I could sort of try to recalibrate for it, I felt that I was losing touch with what was real information because yeah. people are performing people are faking people are not who themselves or they're, they're you're seeing people at their worst and so i felt like all right what's at what's being advertised to me here on a not just a daily basis i you know a, a hourly basis or you know in increments sometimes of you know multiple times an hour i mean i probably check twitter you know at minimum 10 times a day, and maybe I was checking it 100 times a day on some days, right, where I, things were really active and I was really engaged with something. Um, what was being delivered into my brain there was a, was fa su subtly false information about how dishonest and, um, you know, just generally unethical totally normal people are capable of being right it was like it was it, was a, it is a funhouse mirror it was, it was i was seeing the most grotesque versions of people who i know right people who i know i could sit down at and, and, and dinner with and they would never behave this way and yet they were they were coming at me on twitter in i mean it's, 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 it was essentially turning ordinary people into sociopaths right it's like people are just um you know, it's and there are analogies that many of us have made. It's like it's like one analogy is road rage, right? Like people behave in the confines of a car mm -hmm. in ways that they never would if they didn't have this metal box around them, you know, and moving at speed. And it's it's you know all of that becomes quite hilarious and and um, you know obviously dysfunctional when they actually have to stop at the light next to the person they just flipped off, and they realize they didn't realize they didn't understand that the person coming out of that car next to them with cauliflower ear. Is someone who they never would have, yeah. you know, rolled their eyes at in public because they, they would have taken one look at this person and realized this, this is the last person you want to fight with. And I, I think I was guilty of that, definitely. Um, you know, I, I don't think I, there's nothing I, I don't think I ever did anything that I really feel bad about. But yeah, it was always pushing me to the edge of snideness somehow and um it's just not healthy it's not it's not uh so so the so the reason why i deleted my twitter account in the end was that it was obviously making me a worse person and and so and yeah is there some way to be on there where he's not making you a worse person I, i'm sure there is but it's given the nature of the platform and given what was coming back at me on it the way to do that is just to basically 
use it as a one-way channel of yeah. of communication, just 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 marketing. You know, it's like here here's what I what I'm paying attention to. Look at it if you want to, and you just, you just push it out, and then you don't you don't look at what's coming back at you. I used it that way too, and that was what kept me hooked. But then there's also uh, Touch Balls sixty nine wrote a question. No. Ask I can't, what? Ima- I can't imagine. <laughs> This is part of it. I mean, one way to solve this is, uh, you know, we got to get rid of anonymity for this. It's like, well, let me ask the question. Ask Sam why he sucks was the question. Yeah, that's, that's good. Well, one, <laughs> yeah. one reason why I sucked was Twitter. That was, uh, and I, I've since solved that problem. So I mean, touch, touch ball. <laughs> like, I don't read too much into that kind of comment. It's like, it's just, that's just, uh, trolling and it's you know i i get what's i i get i understand the fun the person is having on the other side of that it's like do you though i do well i do i don't i mean i don't behave that way but i do and for all i know that person could be you know 16 years old right so it's yeah. it's like it could it, be also an alt account for elon i don't know well, well yeah that's right yeah, yeah, yeah. um no i'm pretty sure elon would just tweet that uh, you know under his own name at this point um oh, man. but Maybe. Like in the next five I, I, years. I, I don't know. I'm, I think I'm agnostic as to whether or not he or anyone could make a social media platform that really uh, was healthy. Yeah, and I've also seen the negativity in other people's lives. I mean, it's, it's obviously, I mean, he's not, gonna, he's not gonna admit it, but I think it's obviously negative for Elon, right? I mean, it's just not, it's, uh, I mean, that was one of the things that, you know, he, you know when I was looking into the Funhouse mirror, I was also seeing the the Funhouse mirror on his side of Twitter, and it was just even more exaggerated. It's like well, we, when I when I was asking myself why is he spending his time this way, I then reflected on why why you know why was I spending my time this way to a lesser degree, right, and, and at lesser scale, and at, at lesser risk, frankly, right, and so, um, and it was just so. It, it's not just Twitter. I mean, it's, it, it's this isn't part an internet phenomenon it's like the, the the whole hunter biden mess that you you um explored st- uh, explored <laughs> that was based on, i mean it was on i was on somebody's podcast but that was based on a clip taken from that podcast which was highly misleading as to the the, the general shape of my remarks on that podcast even you know i i had to then do my own podcast uh untangling all of that and Admitting that even in even in the full context, I was not speaking especially well and didn't say exactly what I thought in a way that was would have been recognizable to anyone, you know, even someone with not functioning by a, a, a spirit of charity. But but the clip was quite distinct from the podcast itself. Mm-hmm. The reality is is that we're living in an environment now where people are so lazy and there's their 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 attention is so fragmented. That they they only have time for clips. But ninety nine percent of people will see a clip and will assume there's no relevant context I need to understand what happened in that clip, right? And obviously, the people who make those clips know that, right? And, and they're doing that, qu- doing it quite maliciously. And in this case, the person who made that clip and subsequent clips of other podcasts was quite maliciously trying to engineer, you know, some re- reputational uh, immolation for me. Um, and being signal boosted by Elon and other prominent people who can't take the time to watch anything other than a clip, even when it's their friend or someone who's ostensibly their friend in that clip, right? So it's a total failure, an understandable failure of ethics that everyone is so short on time and they're so fucking lazy that they're ju- and 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 we now have these contexts in which we react so quickly to things, right? Like Twitter is inviting an, an instantaneous reaction to this clip um, that it's um, it's just too tempting to just say something and not know what you're even commenting on. And most of, most of the people who saw that clip don't understand what I what I actually think about any of these issues. And the irony is. People are going to find clips from this conversation that are just as misleading, mm-hmm. and they're going to export those, and then people are going to be dunking on those clips. 
And, you know, we're all living and dying by clips now, and it's, um, it's dysfunctional. In the context I mean, the, the of truth knowing is, your past. The truth <laughs> is you <laughs> even need, like, I even give Trump the benefit of the doubt when I see a clip of Trump. Mm -hmm. So, because there are famous clips of Trump that are very misleading as to what he was saying in context. And I've been honest about that. Like the whole, you know, there were good people on both sides mm -hmm. scandal around the char his remarks after Charlottesville. The, the clip that got exported and got promoted by everyone, you know, left of center, from Biden on down, you know, the New York Times, CNN, there's, there's nobody that I'm aware of who has honestly, uh, you know, apologized for what they did with that clip. That clip, he did not say what he seemed to be saying in that clip about the, the Nazis at Charlottesville, right? And I have always been very clear about that. Uh, so it's just, you know, I, I even even people who I think should be marginalized and people who who um, who should be defenestrated because they really are terrible people who are doing dangerous things and, are, and, and for bad reasons. I think we should be honest about what they actually meant in context, right? And and this this goes to anyone else we might talk about, you know, who are, who's more where the where the case is much more confusing. But mm -hmm. yeah, so everyone's it's just so. And then you know, I'm sure we're going to get to AI, but you know, the the prospect of being able to manufacture clips with AI and deep fakes. And that where it's going to be hard for most people most of the time to even figure out that the, the, whether they're in the presence of something real, um, you know, forget about being divorced from context. There was no context. Uh, I mean, that is a, it's, that's an, a, a misinformation apocalypse that is we are right on the cusp of, and uh, you know, it's it's terrifying. But we can't live that way. People function on the basis of what they assume is true, right? They think you people know, have functioned well, to do anything. It's like I mean, you have to you have to know what you think is going to happen, or, or you have to at least give a probabilistic weighting uh, over the future. Otherwise, you're you're going to be incapacitated by you're not going to like people want certain things, and they have to have a rational plan to get those desires gratified. And you know, they don't want to die. They don't want their kids to die. You tell them that there's a comet hurtling toward Earth, and they should get outside and look up. Right? They're going to do it, and if it turns out it's misinformation, you know, it's it's uh, it's going to matter because it comes down to like what medicines do you give your children? Right? Like what, we're going to be manufacturing fake journal articles. I mean, this is I'm sure someone's using ChatGPT for for this, you know, as we speak, mm -hmm. and. If it's not credible, if it's not persuasive now to most people, I mean, honestly, I don't think we're going it's, to, it's, it's, I'll be amazed if it's a year before it, we, we can actually create journal articles that it would take, a, you know, a, a PhD to debunk uh, that are completely fake. Um, and there are people who are celebrating this kind of... Um, you know, coming cataclysm, but I, I just, it's just, they're the people who don't have anything to lose who are celebrating it or just are so confused that they just don't even know what's at stake. And then they're the people who have met the few people who we could count on a few hands who have managed to insulate themselves, or at least imagine they've insulate, insulated themselves from the downside here enough that they're not implicated in the great unraveling we are witnessing or could, could witness. <laughs> I think it's it's important to acknowledge up front that this it, there's something paradoxical about how we relate to uh, to authority, especially within science. Um, and I don't think that paradox is going away. And it's just it doesn't have to be confusing. It's just it's, and it's not it's not truly a paradox. It's just like there are different moments in time. So it is true to say that within science or within any, within rationality generally i mean just when, whenever you're making having a fact based discussion mm -hmm. about anything it is true to say that the truth or falsity of a statement does not even slightly depend 
on the credentials of the person making the statement, right? So it doesn't matter if you're a Nobel laureate, you can be wrong, right? The thing you could, you, the last sentence you spoke could be total bullshit, right? And it's also possible for someone who's deeply uninformed to be right about something or, and, or to be right for the wrong reasons, right? Or, or someone just gets lucky or someone, or, or and there, there are middling cases where you have like a, a backyard astronomer who's got no credentials, but he just loves astronomy and he's got a telescope and it's he spends a lot of time looking at the night sky and he discovers a comet that no one else has seen, you know, not even the professional expert astronomers. Um, I mean, I gotta think that happens less and less now, but but some version of that keeps happening right. and, it, and it may always keep happening in every area of expertise, right? Um, so it's true that truth is orthogonal to the reputational concerns we have among apes who are talking about the truth. Um, but it is also true that most of the time, real experts are much more reliable than frauds or people who are not experts, right? Or, you know, so, and expertise really is a thing, right? And when, it, you know, when you're flying an airplane in a, in a storm, you don't want just randos come into the cockpit saying, listen, I've got a new idea about how to, you know, how we should tweak these controls, right? You want someone who's a trained pilot and, and, and that training gave them something, right? It gave them a set of competences and intuitions and they, they know what all those dials and switches do, right? And I don't, right? I shouldn't be flying that plane. Um, and so when things really matter, you know, and putting this at 30,000 feet in a storm, sharpens this up, we want real experts to be in charge, right? And we are at 30,000 feet a lot of the time on a lot of issues, right? And whether they're public health issues, whether it's issue, whether it's a, a geopolitical emergency like Ukraine, I mean, the climate change, I mean, just pick your, pick your topic. Um, there are real problems and the clock is rather often ticking and their solutions are non obvious right and and so expertise is a thing and deferring to experts much of the time makes a lot of sense it's at minimum it it prevents it you know, spectacular errors of incompetence and and uh just uh you know foolhardiness but it, even in, in the case of some, where, where you're talking about someone, I mean, people like ourselves who are like, we're well-educated, we, we're not the, the worst possible candidates for you know, the Dunning-Kruger effect. When we're going into a new area where we're not experts, we're fairly alert to the possibility that we don't, you know, it's not as simple as things seem at first, and we don't, you know, we don't know how our tools translate to this new area. We can be fairly circumspect, but we're also, because we're well-educated, we, we can, we're, and we're pretty quick studies, we can learn a lot of things pretty fast and we can begin to play a language game that sounds fairly expert, right? And in that case, the, the invitation to do your own research, right, is in, when, when times are good, I view as an invitation to waste your time pointlessly, mm -hmm. right? It, when times are good. Now, the truth is times are not all that good, right? And we have the, the ongoing public display of failures of expertise. We have experts who are obviously corrupted by bad incentives. We've got e experts who you know, perversely won't admit they were wrong when they in fact you know, are demonstrated to be wrong. We've got institutions that have been captured by uh, political ideology that's not truth tracking. I mean, this, this, this whole woke, um, uh, encroachment into really every place, you know, whether it's universities or science jour journals or government, or, I mean, it's just like, that is, that has been genuinely deranging. Um, so there's a lot going on that where, where experts and, and the very concept of expertise has seemed to discredit itself. But the reality is, is that there is a massive difference when anything matters, when there's anything to know about anything, there is a massive difference most of the time between someone who has really done the work to understand that domain and someone who hasn't. And if I get sick, 
or someone close to me gets sick. You know, I, I have a PhD in neuroscience, right? So I can read a medical journal article and understand a lot of it, right? And I, you know, so I'm, I'm just fairly conversant with, you know, medical terminology. Um, and I understand its methods and I, I'm alert to the difference because I've, you know, because in neuroscience, I've spent hours and hours in journal clubs, you know, diagnosing, you know, the and analyzing the difference between good and bad studies. I, I'm alert to the difference between good and bad studies in, in medical journals, right? And I understand that bad studies can get published and, uh, you know, et cetera. Uh, and, and, and experiments can be poorly designed. I'm alert to all of those things. But when I get sick or when someone close to me gets sick, I don't pretend to be a doctor, right? I don't, I've got no clinical experience. I don't go down the rabbit hole on Google for days at a stretch trying to become a doctor, much less a specialist in the domain of problem that has been visited upon me or my family, right? So if someone close to me gets cancer, I don't pretend to be an oncologist. I don't go out and start, re I don't start reading, you know, in journals of oncology and try to really get up to speed as an oncologist because it's, it's not, it's, one is a one is a bad and potential and very likely misleading use of my time, right? And and it's if I decide if I had if I had a lot of runway if I decided okay, it's really important for me to know everything I can at this point. I want to I know someone's going to get cancer. I may not go back to school and become an oncologist. But what I want to do is I want to know everything I can know about cancer, right? So I'm going to take the next four years and spend most of my time on cancer. Okay, I could do that, right? I still think that's a waste of my time. Mm -hmm. uh, I still think at the end of, even at the end of those four years, I'm not going to be the best person to, to form intuitions about what to do in the face of the next cancer that, that I have to confront. Um, I'm still going to want a better oncologist than I've become to tell me what he or she would do if they were in my shoes or in the shoes of you know my family member, I'm gonna you know I'm, what I'm what I'm not advocate I'm not advocating a a blind trust in authority. Like if you get cancer and you're talking to one oncologist and they're recommending some course of treatment, by all means get a second opinion, get a third opinion, right? But it matters that those opinions are coming from real experts and not from you know. Robert Kennedy Jr., you know, who's telling you that, you know, you got it because you got a, you know, a vaccine, right? It's like, it's, it's just, it, 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 there's, we're swimming in a sea of misinformation where you've got people who are moving the opinions of millions of others who, sh who should not have an opinion on these topics. Like, there, there's no, there is no scenario in which you should be getting your opinion about vaccine safety or, or climate change, or uh, the war in Ukraine, or anything else that we might want to talk about from Candace Owens, right? It's just like like the, like she she's not a relevant expert on any of those topics, and what's more, she doesn't seem to care, right? And 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 she's living in a culture that has had, that has amplified that not caring into a business model and an effective business model, right? So it's just. It's um, and that, there's something very Trumpian about all that. Right? Like that's that's the pro the the problem is is the culture. It's not th these these specific individuals. Um, so so the paradox here is that expertise is a real thing, and we defer to it a lot as a as a labor saving device, and it's just as and just uh, based on the, the 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 reality that. It's very hard to be a polymath, right? And specialization is a thing, right? And so there are people who specialize in a very narrow topic. They know more about that topic than the next guy, no matter how smart that that guy or gal is. Uh, and and that those differences matter. But it's also true that when you're talking about facts, sometimes the 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 best experts are wrong. The scientific consensus is wrong. You get a, a, a sea change in the thinking of a whole field because one person who's an outlier for whatever reason decides, okay, I'm, uh, you know, I'm going to prove this point and they prove it, right? So somebody like uh, the doctor who uh, 
believe that that stomach ulcers were not due to stress, but were due to to um, H. pylori infections, right? So he just drank a vial of H. pylori bacteria and and proved that, and quickly got an ulcer and convinced the field that that at minimum H. pylori was involved in in that process. Okay, so yes, everyone was wrong. That doesn't disprove the reality of expertise. It doesn't disprove the utility of relying on experts most of the time, especially in an emergency, especially when the clock is ticking, especially when you're, you know, you're, you're in this particular cockpit and you only have one chance to land this plane, right? You want the real pilot uh, at the controls. Let me be clear. I'm not saying you shouldn't do any research, right? I'm not saying that you shouldn't be informed about an issue. I'm not saying you shouldn't read articles on on whatever the topic is. And yeah, yes, if I got cancer or someone close to me got cancer, I, 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 I probably would read more about cancer than I've read thus far about cancer. And I've read some. Um, so I'm not, I'm not making a virtue of ignorance and a blind obedience to authority. And, I, and again, I recognize that, that authorities can discredit themselves or they can be wrong. Uh, they can be wrong even when they had that when there's no discredit. They just there's a lot we don't understand about the the nature of the world. Um, but still, this this vast gulf between truly informed opinion and bullshit exists. It always exists, and um, and conspiracy thinking is rather often, you know, most of the time, a species of bullshit. But it's not always wrong, right? There are real conspiracies, and there there really are just awful corruptions of you know, but born of bad incentives within our you know our scientific processes within institutions. And again, we mentioned a, a lot of these things in passing. But you know, what what woke political ideology did to scientific communication during the pandemic? Was awful, and it was really corrosive of public trust, especially on the on the right, um, for understandable reasons. I mean, it was just it was crazy some of the things that were being said, and still is. And these cases are all different. I mean, like you, you take depression. We just don't know enough about depression for you know a, a, anyone to be that confident about anything, right? And there are many different modalities in which to interact with it as a problem, right? So there's yes, pharmaceuticals. Have whatever promise they have, but there's there's certainly reason to be concerned that they don't work well for everybody, and and uh, yeah, I mean that's it's obvious they don't work well for everybody, but th- they do work for some people. Um, but again, d- d- depression is a multifactorial problem, and there there are different levels at which to to influence it, and there you know there are things like meditation, there are things like just life changes, and and uh, you know, one of the perverse things about depression is that when you're depressed, all of the things that would be good for you to do are precisely the things you don't want to do. You don't have any energy to socialize. You don't want to get things done. You don't want to exercise. You don't. And um, all of those things, if you got those up and running, they do make you feel better. In you know, in the aggregate. But um, the reality is that there, you know, there are clinical level depressions that are so bad that it's just. We just don't have good tools for them, and it's not enough to tell. You, there's no life change someone's going to going to embrace that is going to be a, an obvious remedy for that. Um, the pa- I mean, pandemics are are obviously a, a complicated problem, but I I would consider it much simpler than depression in terms of you know what's on the menu to be dis- chosen. Uh, among you know, the, the various choices. It's less multifactorial. The logic sure. by which you would make those choices. Yeah. So it's like, we have a virus, we have a new virus. It's some version of bad, you know, it's human transmissible. We're still catching up. We're catching up to every aspect of it. We don't know how it spreads. We don't know how- we, we, How effective well, masks are. Well, at a certain point, we knew it was respiratory, but we- kn- but, 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 respiratory, but yeah, but, and whether means, it's we had spread yeah. by fomites, so like all that, we were confused about a lot of things. And we're still confused. It's been a moving target this whole time, and it's been changing this whole time. And our responses to it have been, you know, we we ramped up the vaccines as quickly as we as we could, but you know, too quick for some, not as not uh, quick enough for others. We could have done human challenge trials and got them out more quickly with 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 better data. 
Um, and I think that's something we should probably look at in the future because you know, that, you know, to my eye, that would make ethical sense to do to do challenge trials. Um, but and and so much of my concern about COVID, I mean, many people are confused about my concern about COVID. My, my concern about COVID has, f- for much of the time, not been narrowly focused on COVID itself and how dangerous I perceive COVID to be as a as a illness. Um, it has been for the longest time even more a concern about our ability to respond to a truly scary pathogen next time. Like what I, I for you know, outside those initial months, you know, if, if, give me the the first six months to be quite worried about COVID and and the unraveling of society. But and the supply of toilet paper. You want to secure a steady supply of toilet paper. Uh, but beyond the, that initial period, when we had a sense of what we were dealing with, and we had every hope that the vaccines are actually going to work, and we're getting, and we knew we were getting those vaccines in short order, right? Beyond that, and and we had and and we knew just how dangerous the, the illness was and how dangerous it wasn't. Um, for years now, I've just been worrying about this as a failed dress rehearsal for something much worse. Right? I think what we prove to ourselves at this moment in history is that we have built informational tools that we do not know how to use, to and we have made ourselves. We, we basically enrolled all of human society into a psychological experiment that is deranging us and making it virtually impossible to solve coordination problems that we absolutely have to solve next time when things are worse. So much blame to go around, but so much of it is not a matter of bad people conspiring to do bad things. It's a matter of uh, incompetence and misaligned incentives and just just ordinary, you know, just plain vanilla dysfunction. My fear is that there was going to be that complete distrust anyway, given the nature of the information space, given the level of conspiracy thinking, given the gaming of, of the, these tools by an anti-vax cult. I mean, there really is an anti-vax cult that that just ramped up its its energy during this moment. Um, but it's so a it, small one. It, right? it's, it's not to say that everything, every concern about vaccines is a, a species of, it was born of misinformation or born of this cult, but there is a cult that is just, you know, and, and you know, and the core of Trumpism is a cult. I mean, you know, QAnon is a cult. Um, and so there's a lot of lying and there's a lot of confusion. Uh, you know, there there are, it's almost impossible to exaggerate how confused some people are and how and how fully their their lives are organized around that confusion. I mean, there are people who think that the world's being run by pedophile cannibals and that, you know, Tom Hanks and Oprah Winfrey and Michelle Obama are among those cannibals. I mean, like they're adjacent to the pure crazy, there's the semi-crazy, and adjacent to the semi-crazy, there's the grifting opportunist asshole. And and the 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 layers of 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 bad faith are you know hard to fully uh, diagnose. But the problem is all of this is getting signal boosted by a a an outrage machine that is preferentially spreading misinformation. It has a business model that is is guaranteeing that is is preferentially sharing misinformation. It's difficult. To- Here's the case I would make yeah. because I don't think you can use reason. I think you have to use empathy. You have to well, understand. No, but how- what, but what, like part of it, I mean, I, I find it very difficult to believe that anyone believes these things. I mean, I think that there's, and there's, I'm sure there's some number of people who are just pretending to believe these things because it's just, again, it's, this is sort of like the four chanification of everything. It's just, it's just a, it's just, good, it's just Pepe the Frog, right? Like none of this is what it seems. They're not signaling an, an alliance with white supremacy or neo-Nazism, but they're not not doing it. Like they just don't fucking care. It's just cynicism overflowing its banks, right? It's just fun to 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 wind up the normies, right? Mm-hmm. Like look at all the normies who don't understand that a green frog is just a green frog, even when it isn't just a green frog, right? It's like they're just, it's just gumming up 
uh, everyone's cognitive bandwidth with bullshit, right? I get that that's fun if you're a teenager and you just want to vandalize our our new sphere, uh, but at a certain point, you, we have to recognize that real questions of human welfare are in play, right? There's like there really there is this there are wars getting fought or not fought, and there's a pandemic raging and. There's medicine to take or not take, but I mean to come back to the, this issue of COVID, I don't think my I don't think I got so out of balance around COVID. I, I think people are quite confused about what I was concerned about. I mean, like I, there was a yes, there was a period where I was crazy because anyone who was taking it seriously was crazy because they had no idea what was going on. And so it's like, yes, I was wiping down packages with with alcohol wipes, right? Because people thought. It was tr transmissible by touch, right? That so, and then when we realized that was no longer the case, I stopped doing that. But so there, there again, it was it was a moving target, and a lot of things we did in hindsight around masking and school closures looked fairly dysfunctional, right? But I unnecessary. I understand that people have that sense. I'll tell you how I thought about it and think about it. One, again, it was a moving target. So there was a point in the timeline where it was totally rational to expect that the vaccines were were both working, but both they were they were reasonably safe and that and that COVID was reasonably dangerous. and that the trade-off for basically everyone was it was rational to get vaccinated, given how many given the level of testing, and how many people had been vaccinated before you, given what we were seeing with COVID, right? Um, that that was a forced choice. You're either going to, you're eventually going to get COVID, and the question is, do you want to be vaccinated when you do, right? At, there was a period where that forced choice, where it, it was just obviously reasonable to get vaccinated, in especially because there was every reason to expect that while it wasn't a perfectly sterilizing vaccine, it was going to knock down transmission a lot. And that matters. And so it wasn't just a personal choice. You were actually being a good citizen when you decided to run whatever risk you, you were going to run to get vaccinated, because there are people in our society who can't actually can't get vaccinated. I mean, I know people who can't take any vaccines. They're so, they're so allergic to I mean, it's, they They, in their own person, seem to justify all of the fears of the anti-vax cult. I mean, it's like they're the kind of person who Robert Kennedy Jr. can point to and say, "See, vaccines are, will, will fucking kill you, right?" Because because of the the experiences, and they and we're still. They, I know people who have kids who fit that description, right? So, um, we should all feel a civic responsibility to be vaccinated against egregiously awful and transmi transmissible diseases for which we have relatively safe vaccines. To keep those sorts of people safe, and there was a period of time when it was thought that the vaccine could stop transmission. Yes, and so again, all of this has has begun to shift. Um, I don't think it has shifted as much as Brett Weinstein thinks it's shifted. But yes, there are safety concerns around the mRNA vaccines, f especially for young men. Right, as far, as far as I know, that's the that's the purview of the of of actual heightened concern. Um, but also, there's there's now there's a lot of natural immunity out there. A lot of basically everyone who was who was going to get vaccinated has gotten vaccinated. The virus has evolved to the point in in, in this context where it seems less uh, dangerous. You know, again, I don't I, I I'm going more on on the seemings than on on research that I've done at the, at this point, but. I'm certainly less worried about getting COVID. I've had it once. I've been vaccinated. I've like it's like. So you ask me now, how do I feel about getting the next booster? I don't know that I'm going to get the next booster, right? So, so I, I was somebody who was waiting in line at four in the morning, you know, hoping to get get a some overflow vaccine when it was first available, and I that was at that point, given what we knew or given what I thought I knew based on the best sources I could consult and based on, you know, based on anecdotes that were too vivid to ignore, you know, both data and, and personal experience, um, it was totally rational for me to, to want to get that vaccine as, as soon as I could. And now I think it's totally rational for me to, to do a, a, 
a different kind of cost-benefit analysis and wonder, listen, do I really need to get a booster, right? You know, like how many of the how many of these boosters am I going to get for the rest of my life, really? Um, and how safe is uh, the mRNA vaccine for a man of my age, right? And do I need to be worried about myocarditis for you know? All of that is completely rational to talk about now. My concern is that at every point along the way, I was the wrong person and, and, and Brett Weinstein was the wrong person and there's many other people I could add to this list to have strong opinions about any of this stuff. There, but there would be deference to experts yes. and pseudo experts behind all of that. Well, the papers, you would stand on the shoulders of giants, but you can surf those shoulders better than the giants themselves. Yeah, but I seems. knew we were going to disagree about that. Like, I, I, I saw his podcast where he brought on these experts who had, many of them had the right credentials, but for a variety of reasons, they didn't pass the smell test for me. I mean, the, 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 one larger problem, and this goes back to the, the problem of, of how we rely on authority in science is that you can always find a PhD or an MD to, to champion any crackpot idea, right? You could, you could, I mean, it is amazing, but you could find PhDs and MDs who would sit up there in front of Congress and say that they thought smoking was not addictive, you know, or that it was not harmful to, you know, it, there was no direct link between smoking and lung cancer. You can always find those people and you can, and so, but, uh, you know, some of the people Brett found were people who had obvious tells to my point of view, uh, 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 to my eye. I mean, and I saw them on, some of the same people were on Rogan's podcast, right? And um, and it's hard because if a person does have the right credentials and they're not, and they're not saying something floridly mistaken, and we're talking about a, something where it's their genuine unknowns, right? Like how how much do we know about the safety of these vaccines, right? It's it's at that point not a whole hell of a lot. I mean, we have no long term data on mRNA vaccines, but to confidently say that millions of people are going to die because of these vaccines, and to confidently say that ivermectin is a panacea, right? Ivermectin is the thing that prevents COVID, right? Mm -hmm. There was no good reason to say either of those things at that moment, and that's and that and so. Given that that's where Brett was, I felt like there was there was just no there was nothing to debate. We were, we're both the wrong people to get, be getting into the weeds on this. We're both going to defer to our chosen experts. His experts look like crackpots to me, and um, or at least the ones who are most vociferous on those most on those edgiest points. It seemed most. And your experts yeah. seem like what is the term? Mass hysteria. I forgot the well, term. Well, well it's, no, but it's like. It's like with you know climate science. I mean, this this, this old uh, it's received as a canard for for in half of our society now. But the claim that ninety seven percent of climate scientists agree that human caused climate change is a thing, right? So do you go with the ninety seven percent most of the time, or do you go with the three percent most of the time? It's obvious you go with the ninety seven percent most of the time for anything that matters. It's not to say that the three percent are always wrong. Again, the, the, there are things get overturned, and yes, as you say, I mean, I've spent much more time worrying about this on my podcast than I've spent worrying about COVID. Our institutions have lost trust for good reason, right? And and it's it it's an open question whether we can actually get things done with this level of transparency and and pseudo transparency, given our information ecosystems. Like, can we fight a war, really fight a war that we may have to fight, like the next Nazis? Can we fight that war when everyone with an iPhone is showing just how awful it is that, that little girls get blown up when we drop our bombs, right? Like, could we, could we as a society do what we might have to do to, to get, actually get necessary things done when we're living in this, this panopticon of just, you know, everyone's a journalist? Right. Everyone's a scientist. Everyone's an expert. Everyone's got direct contact with the facts or, or some or a semblance of the facts. I don't know. Well, I mean, the jury is still out on some of it. And again, it's a moving target. And, and some of it, I mean, it's complicated. Some of it's a self-fulfilling uh, dynamic where sure. like, so like lockdowns, 
in theory, lockdowns, a lockdown would work if we could only do it, but we can't really do it. And there's a lot of people who won't do it because they're convinced that it's, this is the totalitarian boot, you know, on finally on the neck of, 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 uh, the good people who, um, uh, are always having their interests you know, traduced by the elites, right? So like this is, if you have enough people who think the lockdown for any reason in the face of any conceivable illness, right, is just code for the new world order coming to fuck you over and take your guns, right? Okay, you have a society that is now immune to reason, right? Because there, there are absolutely certain pathogens that we should lock down for next time. Right and 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 it was completely rational in the beginning of this thing to lock down. Given to attempt to lock down, we never really locked down. To attempt some semblance of a lockdown, just to quote bend the curve to spare our healthcare system. Given what we were seeing happening in Italy, right? Like that moment was it was not hard to navigate. At least in in my view, it was obvious at the time. In retrospect, my views on that haven't changed, except for the fact that I recognize maybe it's it's just impossible, given the nature of people's response to that kind of demand, right? We live in a society that's just not going to lock down. Unless the pandemic is much more deadly. Right. So that's a point I made, which you know was maliciously clipped out from some other podcast uh-huh. where someone's trying to make it look like, I want to see children die. Look, there's a pity more children didn't, didn't die from COVID, right? Um, this is uh, it was actually the same person who who uh, I and mean, that's the other thing that got so um, poisoned here. It's like that person, this this psychopath or effective psychopath who's creating these clips of me on podcasts. The second clip of me uh, seeming to say that I wish more children died during COVID, which but it was it was so I, I was so it was so clear in context what I was saying that even the clip betrayed the context, so it didn't actually work. This psycho. And again, I don't know whether he actually is a psychopath, but he's behaving like one because of the incentives of Twitter. This is somebody who Brett signal boosted as a as a very reliable source of information, right? He he kept retweeting this guy at me, against me, right? And this guy, I, at one glance, I knew how unreliable this guy was, right? But I think I I'm not at all set. One thing I think I did wrong, one thing that I do regret. One thing I have not sorted out for myself is how to navigate the the professional and personal pressure that gets applied at this moment where you have a friend or an acquaintance or someone you know who's behaving badly in public or or, or behaving badly behaving in a way that you think is bad in public and they have a public platform where they're influencing a lot of people, and you have your own public platform where you're constantly getting asked to comment on what this this friend or or acquaintance or colleague is doing. I haven't known what I think is ethically right about the choices that seem forced on us in, at moments like this. So, like I've, I've criticized you in public about your, your interview with Kanye. Mm-hmm. Now, in the case, in in that case, I reached out to you in private first and told you exactly what I thought. And then, when I was going to get asked in public or when I was touching that topic on my uh, podcast, I more or less said the same thing that I said to you in private. Right now, that was how I navigated that moment. Um, I did the same thing with with Elon, uh, at least on at the beginning. Um, you know. This we have we have maintained good vibes, that, which is which is not what I Another- can say about Elon. <laughs> I, I think with Brett, I failed to reach out in private uh, to the degree that I should have, and we, we never really had. A, 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 we we had tried to set up a conversation in private that that never happened, but um, there was some communication. But it would have been much better for me to have made more of an effort in private than I did before it spilled out into public. And I would say that's true with other people as well. Yeah, well, so I think these are highly non-analogous cases, right? So your your conversation with Kanye misfired from my point of view for a very different reason. It It was 
it has to do with Kanye. I mean, so Kanye, I don't, I don't know. I've never met Kanye, uh, so obviously I don't know him. Um, but I think he's either obviously in the midst of a mental health crisis, or he's a colossal asshole, or both. I mean, there's actually those aren't mutually exclusive. So one of three possibilities. He's either mentally ill. He's an asshole, or he's a he's mentally ill and an asshole. I think all three it, of those possibilities are possible for the both of us as well. At no one moment, I would argue none of those are are, are right. likely for either of us. But um, possible, but. Not, not to say we don't have our moments. But so so the reason not to talk to Kanye. So you, I think you should have had the conversation you had with him in private. That's great, and there's no I have got no uh, criticism of what you said had it been in private. In public, I just thought you're not doing him a favor. If if he's mentally ill, right? If he's in the middle of a a, a manic episode, or or you know, I'm not a clinician, but I've you know I've heard it said of him that he is bipolar. Um, you're not doing him a favor, sticking a mic in front of him and letting him go off on the Jews or anything else, right? Um, we know what he thought about the Jews. We know that there's not much illumination going to come, it's going to come from him on that topic. And if it is a symptom of his mental illness that he thinks these things, well, then it's, you're not doing him a favor making that even more public. Um, if he's just an asshole and he's just an anti-Semite, you know, an ordinary you know, garden variety anti-Semite, well, then there's also not much to say unless you're really going to dig in and kick the shit out of him in public and I'm I'm saying you can do that with love. I mean, that, that's the other thing here is that I don't agree that compassion and love always have this patient, uh, embracing, acquiescent face, right? Yeah. I, 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 they, they don't always feel good to the recipient, right? There is a sort of wisdom that you can wield compassionately in moments like that, where someone's full of shit and you just make it absolutely clear to them and to your audience that they're full of shit. And it's no, there's no hatred being communicated. In fact, you could just, it's like, listen, I'm gonna do everyone a favor right now and you know, just take your foot out of your mouth. And and um, and the truth is, you know, I wouldn't, I just wouldn't have aired the conversation. Like, I just don't think it was a document that had to get out there, right? I, I, I get that many people, this is not a signal you're likely to get from your audience, right? Like I get that many people in your audience thought, oh my God, that's awesome. You're, you're talking to Kanye and you're doing it in Lex style where it's just love and you're not treating him like a pariah. And you know, you, you're, you're holding this tension between he's this creative genius who is work we love and yet he's having this moment that's so painful and you know, what a tightrope walk. And uh, I get that maybe 90% of your audience saw it that way. They're still wrong. And I and, and I, I still think that was not, on balance not a good thing to put out into the world. You don't think it opens up the mind and heart of people that listen to that? Just have it, it, it seeing if a it person. It does. It's it's let if it's opening it up in the wrong direction where just gale force nonsense is coming in, right? I, I think we should have an open mind and an open heart, but there's some clear things here that that we have to keep in view. One is uh, the mental illness component is its own thing. Yeah. I don't pretend to understand what's going on with him. So, But insofar as that's the reason he's saying what he's saying, do not put this guy on camera and let me... But I had see. to... But when is he shows he... up in a gimp hood on Alex Jones's podcast, I mean, this, this, <laughs> either that's more, you know, genius performance in his world or it's he, he's well, I unraveling further. <laughs> Let's well. leave the mental illness aside. So if, if, if we're going to say that there's no reason to think he's mentally ill, and this is just him being creative and brilliant and opinionated, well, then that falls into the asshole bucket for me. It's like, then then he's someone, and honestly, the most offensive thing about him in that interview, from my point of view, is not the anti-Semitism, which you know, we can talk about, because I think there, there are problems just letting him uh, uh, spread those memes as well. But the most offensive thing is just how delusionally egocentric he is, or was coming off in that interview and in, and in others. Like he he has an estimation of himself as this omnibus genius to, to to rival not only to rival Shakespeare to exceed Shakespeare. Right? I mean, he's like he's he is the greatest mind that has ever walked among us, and he's ex more or less explicit on that point. 
And yet he manages to talk for hours without saying anything actually interesting or insightful or or factually illuminating, right? So it's complete delusion of a very Trumpian sort. You know, it's like it's like you know when Trump says he's a genius who understands everything, and like, but nobody takes him seriously. And one wonders whether Trump takes himself seriously. Kanye seems to believe he he seems to believe his own press. He actually thinks he's he's you know the, uh, just a colossus and. Um, he may be a great musician, you know, I'm not, you know, I, I've, it's certainly not my wheelhouse to compare him to any other musicians, but, um, one thing that's patently obvious in, in, from your conversation is he's not who he thinks he is intellectually or ethically or in any other relevant way. And so when you couple that to the anti-Semitism he was spreading, which I, what was genuinely noxious and ill-considered and, um, has r- potential knock-on effects in the black community. I mean, there's there's, a, there's an ambient level of anti-Semitism in the black community that is worth worrying about and talking about anyway. There's a bunch of guys, you know, playing the knockout game in Brooklyn, just punching Orthodox Jews in the face. And I think letting Kanye air his anti-Semitism that publicly only raises the the likelihood of that rather than diminishes. <laughs> Just, just, you mean anti-Semitic things, or yeah, that you anti-Semitic things? I just hate the word anti-Semitic. It's a, uh, it's like racist. Well, but here's the reality. So I, I'm someone. So I'm Jewish. You know, although obviously not religious. Um, I have never taken. You know, I've, t- I've I've been a student of the Holocaust. Obviously, I I know a lot about that, and and there's reason to to be a student of the Holocaust. Uh, but in my lifetime and in my experience, I have never taken anti-Semitism very seriously. I have not worried about it. I have not um, made a thing of it. I've done exactly one podcast on it. I you know, had Barry Weiss on my podcast um, when her book came out. Uh, but it really is a thing, and it's uh, it's something we have to keep an eye on societally because it it it's a it's a unique kind of hatred, right? It's a, it's a, it's unique in that it seems it's it's knit together with it's not just ordinary racism. It's it, it's knit together with lots of conspiracy theories that never seem to die out. Um, it's it can by turns equally animate the left and the right politically. I mean, what's so perverse about anti-Semitism? Like look, look in the American context with the far right, you know, with white supremacists. Jews aren't considered white, so they, they hate us in the, in the same spirit in which they hate black people or, or brown people or anyone who's not white. But on the left, Jews are considered extra white. I mean, we're, we're, we're the extra beneficiaries of white privilege, right? And in the black community, that is often the case, right? We're, we're a minority that has thrived. And, so, and, and, it, and it seems to stand as a counterpoint to all of the problems of of other, that other minorities suffer, in particular, you know, African Americans in the American context, um, and yeah, Asians are now getting a little bit of this, you know, like the the, the model minority uh, uh, issue, but Jews have had this going on for centuries and and millennia, and it never seems to go away. And it's again, this is something that I've never focused on, but th- this has been at a slow boil for as long as we've been alive and there's no guarantee it can't suddenly become much, much uglier than we have any reason to, to expect it to become even in, in our society. And so, um, there's a, there's kind of a special concern at moments like that, where you have an immensely influential person in a community who already has a checkered history with respect to their own beliefs about the Jews and the conspiracies and all the rest. Uh, and he's just messaging, uh, you know, not especially fully opposed by you and anyone else who's who's given him a, a, the microphone at that moment to the world, and that so that that you know made my spidey sense. Oh yeah, and again, things change when when they're for public consumption. You know, when sure. you're, so it's like, I mean the. the the cut for me that you know has just the use case I keep stumbling upon is the the kinds of things that I will say on a podcast like this or if I'm giving a public lecture versus the kinds of things I will say at dinner with 
strangers or with friends. Like, like if you're in an elevator, like if I'm in an elevator with strangers, I do not feel, and I hear someone say something stupid, I don't feel a, a, a an intellectual responsibility to turn around in a, in a you know, in the con, in the confines of that space with them and say, listen, that thing you just said about X, Y, or Z is completely false, and here's why, right? But if somebody says it in front of me uh, on some public dais where I'm actually talking about ideas, that's when you know you, uh, there's a different responsibility the, that comes online. The so, question is how you say it, how you say it, or even whether you say anything in in those. I mean, there there are moments there 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 are definitely moments to privilege civility or just to pick your battles. I mean, some, sometimes it's just not worth it to get into it with somebody out out in in real life. <laughs> Well, yeah, but until it doesn't, like if because you, you can, you can, right? You There's can extend here. charity too far, right? You can, it, like, it can be absolutely obvious what someone's motives really are, right. and they're they're you know dissembling about that, right? And so then you're taking at face value their representations begins to look like you're just being duped, and you're not you're not actually doing the work of of, of putting pressure on a bad actor, you know? So it's it's. And again, the whole the mental illness component here makes makes it very difficult to think about what you should or shouldn't have said to Kanye. Well, I think we have an uncanny valley problem with respect to this issue of whether or not to speak to bad people, right? So, if if a person is sufficiently bad, right, if they're all the way out of the the valley, then you can talk to them, and it's just it's totally unproblematic. To talk to them because you don't have to spend any time signaling to your audience that you don't agree with them. I and mean, if you're interviewing Hitler, you don't have to say, "Listen, I just got to say before we start, I don't agree with the whole you know genocide thing, and you know I, I just think you're uh, killing you know killing mental patients in vans and all that. All it's a, that was all bad. It's a bad look, Adolf. Uh, so you you just it can go without saying that you don't agree with this person, and you're not platforming them to signal boost their their views, you're just trying to, if they're sufficiently evil, you can go into it very much as an anthropologist would, uh, just, you just want to understand the nature of evil, right? You just want to understand this phenomenon, like how is this person who they are, right? Um, and that strikes me as a intellectually interesting and, and morally necessary thing to do, right? So yes, you, I think you always interview Hitler, Wait, 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 wait. Well, when he, when you know, once he's Hitler. But when do you know it? Once he's legitimately Hitler. But when do you know it? Is, well, yeah. is genocide really happening? Yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. 42, no, 43? No, no. If, if you're on the cusp of it where it's just, he's someone who's gaining power and you don't want to, you don't want to help facilitate that, um, then there's a question of whether you can, you can undermine him in the, by, while pushing back against him in that interview, right? So there are people I wouldn't talk to just because I don't want to give them oxygen, and I don't think that in the in the context of my interviewing them, I'm going to be able to to take the wind out of their sails at all, right? So it's it's like for whatever, either because it's an asymmetric advantage, because I just know that they can do something that they they, they within the span of an hour that I can't that I can't correct for, sure. you know, it's, it's like they can, they can light many small fires and it just takes too much time to put them That's out. That's more like on the topic of vaccines, for example, having a debate right. on the efficacy of vaccines. Yeah. Okay. It's not that I don't think sunlight is usually the best disinfectant. I think it is, you know, even the, these asymmetries aside, I mean, there are, there, it is true that a, a person can always make a mess faster than you can clean it up. Right. But still there are debates worth having, even given that limitation. Um, and they're the right people to have those specific debates. And there's, so there's certain topics where, you know, I'll, I'll debate someone just because I'm the right person for the job, and it doesn't matter how messy they're going to be. I, it's just it's just w worth it because I, I can make my points land at least to to the right part of the audience. So some of it is just your own skill and competence, and also interest in preparing correctly. Well, yeah, yeah, and the nature of the subject matter, and and uh, but. That, yeah, but there are other people who just by default, I would say, well, there's no reason to give this guy a platform. And there, there are also people who are so confabulatory that they're making such a mess with every sentence uh, that you, insofar as you're even trying to interact with what they're saying, 
you are going to, you're by definition going to fail and you're going to seem to fail to an, an un, a sufficiently large uninformed audience where it's going to be a net negative for for the for the cause of truth no matter how good you are so like for instance i think talking to alex jones on any topic for any reason is probably a bad idea because i just think he's he's just neurologically wired to just I mean, utter a string of sentences he'll get 20 sentences out each of which has to be each of which is you know contains more lies than the last and there's just there's not time enough in the world to run down and certainly not time enough in the span of a conversation to run down each of those leads to to bedrock so as to falsify it and maybe he'll just make shit up it just and or and or make shit up and then 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 weave it in with with you know half truths and 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 micro truths that make, give some se- semblance of credibility to somebody out there. I mean, apparently millions of people out there. Um, and there's just no way to to untangle that in real time with him. Here, I'm not talking about micro untruths. I'm just talking about making up things out of whole cloth. Just like is it, if someone says something, but like, well, what about? And then the then the thing they put. It, at the end of that sentence, is just a set of pseudo facts, right? That you can't possibly authenticate or not in the span of that conversation. They will, you know, whether it's about UFOs or anything else, right? They will seem to make you look like an ignoramus when, in fact, everything they're saying is specious, right? Whether they know it or not. I mean, there's some people who are just crazy. There's some people who are who are just bullshitting and they're not even tracking whether it's true. Yeah. It just feels good. And then some people are consciously lying about things. But but the thing is, is I mean, just the, the place I'm familiar with doing this and not doing this is is um, on specific conspiracies like nine eleven truth, right? Like the nine eleven. So I because of my because of what nine eleven did to my. Uh, intellectual life. I mean, it's really just, you know, it it sent me down a path for the better part of a decade. Like I became a critic of religion when I, I don't know if I was ever going to be a critic of religion, right? Like, but that, like the, it happened to be in my wheelhouse because I had spent so much time studying religion uh, on my own. And I was um, also very interested in, in the, the underlying spiritual concerns of every religion. And so I was, I was, um, you know, I devoted a, a, a full more more than a full decade of my life to just you know what is what is real here what is possible what is what is the nature of, of subjective reality and how does it relate to reality at large and is there anything to you know who, just, who was someone like Jesus or Buddha and are they are these people frauds or are they are they are these just uh, are these just myths or, or 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 is there really a continuum of of insight to be had here that is interesting so I spent a lot of time on that question through my 20 the full decade of my 20s and that was launched in part by 9-11 truther uh, no but then when 9-11 happened i had spent all this time you know reading religious books understanding empathically understanding the motivations of religious people right knowing just how fully certain people believe what they say they believe right so i took religious convictions very seriously and then people started flying planes into our buildings and i so i knew that there was something to be said about the, allegedly the, the the core doctrines of Islam, yeah, exactly. So, so I went down. So that was that became my wheelhouse for a time. Um, you know, terrorism and and uh, jihadism and re- related topics. And so the nine eleven truth conspiracy thing kept you know uh, getting aimed at me. And the question was, well, do I do I want to debate? these people mm-hmm. right yeah. like alex and, jones perhaps yeah i mean yeah so alex jones i think was an early purveyor of it although i don't think i knew who he was at that point um and so and privately i had some very long debates with people who you know one person in my family went way down that rabbit hole and i just you know every six months or so i'd literally I'd write the two-hour email you know that that would try to try to deprogram him you know however ineffectually and uh so I went back and forth for years on that topic with with in private with people, but, but I could see the structure of the conspiracy. I could see the nature of 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 of, of how 
of how impossible it was to to play whack a mole sufficiently well so as to so as to convince anyone of anything who was who was not seeing the the problematic structure of that way of thinking. I mean, it's it's not actually a thesis. It's a it's a proliferation of anomalies that, that don't you can't actually connect all the dots that are being pointed to. They they don't connect in a coherent way. There's they're incompatible theses that are not and and their incompatibility is not being acknowledged. Um, but they're they're running this algorithm as, uh, of things are things are never what they seem. There's always malicious conspirators doing things perfectly. That we we see all we see evidence of human incompetence everywhere else. Mm-hmm. No one can tie their shoes, you know, expertly anywhere else. But over here, people are perfectly competent. They're perfectly concealing things. Like the, the thousands of people are collaborating, you know. It, Inexplicably, I mean, incentivized by what? Who knows? They're they're co- collaborating to murder thousands of their neighbors, and no one is breathing a peep about it. No one's getting caught on a on camera. No one's you know, no one's breathed the word of it to a journalist. Um, and so, I've I've dealt with that style of thinking, and I've I know what it's like to be in the weeds of a conversation like that, and 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 the person will say. Okay, well, but what do you make of the fact that um, all those F-16s were flown 800 miles out to sea on the morning of 9-11 to, doing an exercise that hadn't even been scheduled for that day? But it was, mm-hmm. and now all of these, are, I, I, I dimly re- recall some thesis of that kind, but I'm just making these things up now, right? Mm-hmm. So like that that detail hadn't even been scheduled for that day. It was inexplicably run that day. Like, So what, how long would it take to track that down Right, the idea that this is anomalous, like that there was an F F sixteen uh, exercise run on it, uh, and it wasn't even supposed to be been run that day. Right, yeah. someone like Alex Jones, their speech pattern is to pack as much of that stuff in as possible at the highest velocity that a person can speak, and unless you're knocking down each one of those things to that audience. You appear to just be uninformed. You appear yeah. to just not be. You don't. Wait, he, he didn't know about the F-16s. Yeah, um, sure. Uh, he he doesn't know about Project Mockingbird. You haven't heard about Project Mockingbird? I just made up Project Mockingbird. I don't know what it is, but well, well, that's the kind of thing that comes at, tumbling out in in a conversation like that. And that's the kind of thing, frankly, I was worried about in the COVID conversation because not that someone like Brett would do it consciously, but. Someone like Brett is swimming in a sea of misinformation on social, living on Twitter, getting people sending the blog post and the study from, from uh, you know, the Philippines that showed that in this cohort, ivermectin did X, right? And, and not like to actually run anything to ground, right? You have to actually do the work uh, journalistically and scientifically and run it to ground, right? So for many, of the, for some of these questions, you actually have to be a statistician to say, okay, they they use the wrong statistics in this experiment, right? Mm-hmm. Now, yes, we could take all the time to do that, or we could at every stage along the way, in a in, in a context where we we have experts we can trust, go with ninety with what ninety seven percent of the experts are saying about. X yeah. about the safety of mRNA, about the transmissibility of COVID, about whether to wear masks or not wear masks, and I completely agree that that broke down uh, unacceptably in the over the last few years. And that, uh, but I think that's largely a uh, social media and blogs and and the efforts of podcasters and Substack writers. Were not just a response to that. It was a. I think it was. A, it was a symptom of that, and a and a cause of that, right? And I think we're we're living in a an environment where people. It, we basically we we have trained ourselves not to be able to agree about facts on any topic, no matter how urgent, right? What's fl- what's flying in our sky? You know what is you know what is what's happening in Ukraine. Is is Putin just uh, denazifying Ukraine? I mean, like there are people who we respect 
who are spending time down that particular rabbit hole. Like this is, this is, you know, maybe there are a lot of Nazis in Ukraine and that's the real problem, right? Maybe Putin's, maybe Putin's the, not the bad actor here, right? How much time do I have to spend empathizing with Putin to the point of thinking, well, maybe Putin's got a point and it's, it's like, well, what about the polonium and the nerve agents and the killing of journalists and the, you know, Navalny and like, does that count? Well, no, listen, I'm not paying so much attention to that because I'm following all these interesting people on Twitter and they're, they're giving me some pro-Putin material here. And there is a there are some Nazis in Ukraine. It's not like there are no Nazis in Ukraine. How am I going to weight these things? I think people are being driven crazy by Twitter. But but it's not necessarily knowingly bad faith by I mean the people the people who are yeah. who are worried about Ukraine Ukrainian Nazis. To my I mean they're some of the same people. They're the same people who are worried about ivermectin got suppressed. Like uh, ivermectin is really the, a panacea, but it got suppressed for because the, no one could make billions on it. Um, it's a, it, it's the same. It's literally this. It's in many cases the same people and the same efforts to to unearth those. No, I, no, I don't think so. I, I don't think I'd be learning anything about him. It's like with. with with Hitler, and I, I'm not comparing Trump to Hitler, but clips guy, yeah, here's yeah. your chance. Yeah. You got this one. With certain world historical figures, um, I, I would just feel like okay, this is an opportunity to learn something that I'm not going to learn. I, I think Trump is among the most superficial people we have ever laid eyes on. Right? Like he is, he is in public view, right? And I'm sure, I'm sure there's some distance between who he is in private and who he is in public, but it's not going to be the kind of distance that's going to blow my mind. Um, and I think, uh, so I think the liability of, so I, for instance, I think Joe Rogan was very wise not to have Trump on his podcast. I think all he would have been doing is, is he would have put himself in a situation where he couldn't adequately contain the damage Trump was doing. And he was just going to make Trump seem cool to a whole new you know, a potentially new cohort of his massive audience, right? Um, I mean, they would have they would have had a lot of laughs. Trump's funny. I mean, it, 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 w the entertainment value of things is so uh, influential. I mean, there was that one debate where Trump, uh, you know, got a, a massive laugh on the you know his line, you know, only Rosie O'Donnell, right? The truth is we're we're living in a political system where if you can get a big laugh during a political debate, you win. It doesn't matter who you are. Like, like that's the level of of you know, it doesn't matter how uninformed you are, it doesn't matter that half the debate was about what the hell we should do about about um, you know, a threat of nuclear war or anything else. Um it's we're monkeys, right? And we like to laugh. <laughs> Yeah, well, I reached out to him privately when I saw that. Clip. Did you use the power of love? Joe knows I, I love him and consider him a friend, right? So there's no there's no issue there. Um, he also knows I'll, I'll be happy to do his podcast uh, when we get that together. You know, so there's no uh, I have got no policy of not talking to Joe or not doing his podcast. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think we're we got a little sideways along these same lines where you know we've talked about Brett and Elon and other people. Um, it was never to that degree with Joe because um, Joe's in a very different lane, right? He's and consciously so. I mean, Joe is a stand-up comic who interviews, who just uh, is interested in in everything, interviews uh, the widest conceivable variety of people, and just lets his interests collide with their expertise or you know lack of expertise. I mean, he's he's, he's a, again, it's a super wide variety of people. Um, he'll talk about anything, and he can always pull the ripcord, saying, you know, I don't know what the fuck I'm saying. I'm a comic. I'm stoned. We're, we we just drank too much, right? Like like it's, it's very entertaining. It's all in you know to my eye, it's it's all in good faith. I think Joe is an extraordinarily ethical, good person. Also, doesn't use Twitter. 
doesn't really use right. Twitter. Yeah, yeah. No, but the, cru- <laughs> the crucial difference, though, is that because he is an entertainer first. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying he's not smart and he doesn't understand things. He, he. I mean, what, what's confu- potentially confusing is he's very smart and he, he's also very informed. He's, he's, he, his full time job is talk. You know, when he's not doing stand up or doing color commentary for the UFC, his full time job is talking to lots of very smart people at great length. So he's he's created a you know the the Joe Rogan University for himself, and he's he's gotten a lot of information uh, crammed into his head. So. It's not that he's uninformed, but he can always, when he feels that he's uninformed, or when it turns out he was wrong about something, he can always pull the ripcord and say, I, "I'm just a comic. We were stoned. It was fun. You know, don't don't take medical advice from me. I, I don't play a doctor on the internet, right? Um, I can't quite do that, right? You can't quite do that. We're, we're in different lanes. I'm not saying you and I, you and I are in exactly the same lane, but." For much of Joe's audience, I'm just this establishment shill who's just banging on about you know the universities and medical journals and and it, um, it's not true, but that would be the perception. And as a counterpoint to a lot of what's being said on Joe's podcast or or uh, you know certainly Brett's podcast on these topics, I can see how they they would form that opinion. But in reality, if you listen to me long enough, you hear that. I've said as much against the woke nonsense as anyone, even any lunatic on the right who can only keep that bright, shi- that bright, shining object in view, right? Um, so there's nothing that Candace Owens has said about wokeness that I haven't said about wokeness as far in so far as she's speaking rationally about wokeness. Um, but we have to be able to keep multiple things in view, right? If you if you could only look at the problem of wokeness and you couldn't acknowledge the problem of Trump and Trumpism and QAnon and and the explosion of irrationality that was happening on the right and bigotry that was happening on the right, um, you just could, you you were just disregarding half of the landscape. And many people took half of the problem in the in recent years. In the last five years is a story of many people taking half of the problem. And monetizing that half of the problem, and and getting captured by an, an audience that only wanted that half of the problem talked about in that way, and, um, and this is the, this is the larger issue of of um, audience capture, which you know is very I'm sure it's it's an ancient problem, but um, it's a very helpful phrase that I think comes to us courtesy of our mutual friend Eric Weinstein, uh, and. Audience capture is a thing, and I believe I've witnessed many, you know, casualties of it. And if there's anything I've been on guard against in my life, you know, professionally, it's been that. And and when I noticed that I had a lot of people in my audience who didn't like my criticizing Trump, I really leaned into it. And when I noticed that a lot of the other cohort of my audience didn't didn't like me criticizing the far left and wokeness, they thought I was, you know, exaggerating that problem. Mm-hmm. I leaned into it because I thought those parts of my audience were were absolutely wrong, and I didn't care about whether I was going to lose those parts of my audience. Um, there are pe- there are people who have created, you know, knowingly or not, there are people who have created different incentives for themselves because of how they they've monetized their podcast and because of the kind of signal they've responded to in their audience. Um, and I, and I worry about, you know, I, I, you know, Brett would consider this a totally invidious uh, ad hominem thing to say, but I really do worry that that's happened to Brett. I think, I think, I, I cannot explain how you do a hundred, uh, with all the things in the, in the universe to be I- I interested in, and of all the things he's competent to speak intelligently about, I don't know how you do a hundred podcasts in a row on, on COVID, right? It's just, mm. it makes no sense. <laughs> I mean, again, the, the people who think I'm wrong about any of these topics are going to think, okay, you're just not admitting that you're wrong. But it, then now we're having a dispute about specific facts. Um, there are there are things that I believed about COVID or worried might very might be true about COVID two years ago that I no longer believe or I'm not so worried about now and. And vice versa. I mean, like things have flipped. Certain things have flipped upside down. 
Um, the question is, was I wrong? So here's a, here's a cartoon version of it, but this is something I said probably 18 months ago, and it's still true. You know, when I saw what Brett was doing on COVID, you know, let's call it two years ago, I, I, I said, even if he's right, even if he turned, if it turns out that ivermectin is a panacea and the mRNA vaccines kill millions of people, right? He's still wrong right now. His reasoning is still flawed right now. His facts still suck right now, right? And his and his confidence is is unjustified now. That was true then. That will always be true then, right? And 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 so, and not much has changed for me to to revisit any of my time points along the way. Again, I will totally concede that if I had teenage boys. And their do- and their schools were demanding that they be vaccinated with the mRNA vaccine. I would, I would be powerfully annoyed, right? I, like I would, I wouldn't know what I was going to do, and I would be, I would be doing more research about uh, about myocarditis, and I'd be badgering our doctors, and I would be worried that we have a medical system and a pharmaceutical system and a healthcare system and a public health system that's not incentivized to to look at any of this in a fine-grained way and they just want one uh blanket admonition to the entire population just get just take the shot you idiots uh i view that largely as a result a panicked response to the misinformation explosion that happened and the and the public the populist resistance animated by misinformation that just made it impossible to get anyone to to cooperate right so it's just part of it is again a pendulum swing in the wrong direction it's somewhat analogous to the woke response to trump and the trumpist response to woke right so there's, there's a lot of people have just gotten pushed around for bad reasons or but understandable reasons um but yes it's there are there are caveats to my you know, things have changed about my view of, of covid but the question is if you roll back the clock 18 months, was I wrong to want to platform uh, Eric Topol, you know, a, a very well-respected cardiologist on this topic, uh, or, you know, Nicholas Christakis to, to talk about the network effects of, you know, the, you know whether we should sc- close schools, right? He's had written a book on COVID. He's, you know, network effects are his wheelhouse as a both as an MD and as a, a sociologist. Um, there was a lot that we believed we knew about the efficacy of of closing schools during pandemics, right? During the you know during the the Spanish flu pandemic and others, right? But there's a lot we didn't know about COVID. We didn't know we didn't know how uh, negligible the effects would be on kids compared to older people. We didn't know like the. So. What is it? Well, it was a forced choice. You're going to get COVID. Do you want to be vaccinated when you get it? Right. That was always, in my view, an easy choice. And it's up until you you start breaking apart the cohorts and you start saying, okay, wait a minute, there is this myocarditis issue in in young men. Let's talk about that. When that st- before that story emerged, it was just it was just clear that this is. If it's not if it's not knocking down transmission as much as we had hoped, it is still mitigating severe illness and death. Uh, and I, I I still believe that it is the the current view of the of most people competent to analyze the data that we lost something like three hundred thousand people unnecessarily in the U.S. Because of because of vaccine hesitancy, but right? I think there's a way to communicate with humility about the uncertainty of things that would increase the vaccination rate. I do believe that it is rational and sometimes effective to to signal impatience with certain bad ideas, right, and certain conspiracy theories and certain forms of misinformation. I think so. Because it, it's just, I just think it makes you look a douchebag most times. Well, no, I mean, certain people are persuadable, certain people are not not persuadable. But it's um, no, because there's not enough. It's it's the opportunity cost. Not everything can be 
given a patient hearing. It's like you can't have a physics conference and then let people in to just trumpet their pet theories about you know, the grand unified vision of physics um, when they're obviously crazy or they're obviously half crazy or they're just not, or, you know, the, the people, it's like you begin to, you begin to get a sense for this when it is your wheelhouse, but there are people who kind of declare their, their irrelevance to the conversation fairly quickly without knowing that they have done it. Right. And, uh, and the truth is, I think I'm one of those people on the topic of COVID, right? Like I, it's like, it's not, it's never that I felt, listen, I know exactly what's going on here. I know these mRNA vaccines are safe. I know exactly, I know, I know exactly how to run a lockdown. I, no, this is, this is a situation where you want the actual pilots to fly the plane, right? We needed experts who we could trust. And insofar as our experts got captured by, by all manner of thing. I mean, some of them got captured by Trump. Some of them were made to look ridiculous just standing next to Trump while he was bloviating about, you know, whatever, that, you know, that it's just going to go away. There's just 15 people, you know, there's 15 people in a cruise ship and it's just going to go away. There's going to be no problem. Or it's like it, it, when he said he, you know, many of these doctors think I understand this better than them. They're just amazed at how I understand this. And you've got doctors, real doctors, the heads of the CDC, yeah, and and NIH standing around just ashen faced while he's talking, you know, um, all of this was deeply corrupting of the public communication of science. On and then again, I've banged on about the depredations of wokeness. The woke thing was a disaster, right? Still is a disaster, uh, but the, yeah. it doesn't mean that. I mean, but the thing is, there's a big difference between me and Brett in this case. I didn't do a hundred podcasts on COVID. I did like two podcasts on COVID. The measure of my concern about COVID can be measured in how many podcasts I did on it, right? It's like, once we had a sense of how to live with COVID, I was just living with COVID, right? Like, okay, you get vaxxed or don't get vaxxed. Wear a mask or don't wear a mask. Travel or don't travel. Like you've got a few things to decide, but my kids were stuck at home on iPads, you know, for too long. I didn't agree with that. You know, it was obviously not functional. Like I, I criticized that on the margins, but there was not much to do about it. But the, the the thing I didn't do is make this my life and just browbeat people with one message or another. We need a public health regime where we can trust what the competent people are saying to us about you know what medicines are safe to take. And in the absence of that, craziness is going to, even in the presence of that, craziness is going to proliferate given the tools we've built. But in the absence of that, it, it's going to proliferate for understandable reasons. And that's going to, it's, it's not going to be good next time when, when something orders of magnitude more dangerous hits us. And, that, and that's, I spend, you know, insofar as I think about this issue, I think much more about next time than this time. <laughs> I think Brett is very smart and he's a very um, ethical person who wants good things for the world. I mean, I have no reason to doubt that. Uh, so the fact that we're on, you know, we're crosswise on this issue is not, does not mean that I think he's a bad person. I mean, the, the thing that worried me about what he was doing, and this was true of Joe, and this was true of Elon, this is true of many other people, is that once you're messaging at scale to a vast audience, you incur a certain kind of responsibility not to to get people killed. And I, I do I did worry that yeah, people were people were making decisions on the basis of the information that was getting shared there. And that that's why I was, I think, fairly circumspect. I just said, okay, give me the the center the fairway expert opinion at this time point and at this time point and at this time point and then I'm out right I don't have any more to say about this I'm not an expert on covid I'm not an expert on the safety of mrna vaccines um if something if something changes so as to become newsworthy then maybe I'll do a podcast so I mean I just did a podcast on lab, the lab leak lab, lab right leak. I was never skeptical of the lab leak hypothesis Brett was very early on saying, this is this is a lab leak, right? 
um, at a point where my only position was, who cares if it's a lab leak, right? Like this, there's the thing we have to get straight is what do we do given the nature of this pandemic? But also we should say that you've actually stated that it is a possibility. Oh yeah. You just said it doesn't, doesn't it, quite it did, matter. It, I mean, it, the time to figure that out now, I've actually, I have had my, my podcast guest on this topic changed my view of this because the, you know, one of the guests, uh, Alina Chan made the point that no, actually the, the best time to figure out the origin of this is immediately, right? Yeah. Because in the evidence, you lose touch with the evidence. And I hadn't really been thinking about that. Like I didn't, I, if you come back after a year, um, you know, there are certain facts you might not be able to get in hand, but I've always felt that it didn't matter for two reasons. W one is we had the genome of the virus and and we could design, we very quickly designed, immediately designing vaccines against that genome. And that's what we had to do. And then we had to figure out how to vaccinate and to and to mitigate and to develop treatments and all of that. So the origin story didn't matter. Generically speaking, either or origin story was politically inflammatory and ma made the Chinese look bad, right? And the Chinese response to this looked bad, whatever the origin story, right? They're not yeah. cooperating. They're letting, they're, they're stopping their domestic flights, but letting their international flights uh, go. I mean, it's just, they were bad actors and they should be treated as such regardless of the origin, right? And, and you know, I, I would argue that the wet market origin is even more politically invidious than the lab leak origin. I mean, Why do you think? Because for lab leak, for, to my eye, the lab leak can happen to anyone, right? We're all running, all these advanced countries are running these dangerous labs. That's a practice that we should be worried about, you know, uh, in general. We know lab leaks are a problem. There have been multiple lab leaks of even worse things but that haven't gotten out of hand in this way, but, you know, w worse pathogens. Um, we're we're wise to be worried about this. And on some level, it could happen to anyone, right? The wet market makes them look like barbarians living in another century. Like you got to clean up those wet markets. Like what the, you, what are you doing putting a bat on top of a pangolin, on top of a duck? On top, it's like, get your shit together. So like, if anything, the wet market makes them look worse in my view. Now I'm sure there's, uh, I'm sure that what they actually did to conceal a lab leak, if it was a lab leak, I mean, all of that's going to look odious. Um, yeah, no, I would agree. that so, so that exchange with Fauci and Rand Paul that went viral, yeah, I would agree that Fauci looked like he was taking refuge in kind of very lawyered language yeah. and not giving a straightforward account of what we do and why we do it. And so, yeah, I think it, it looked shady. It played shady and it probably was shady. I mean, I don't, I don't know how personally entangled he is with any of this, but yeah, the, the gain of function research is something that I think we're wise to be worried about. And insofar as I judge myself adequate to have an opinion on this, I think it should be banned Right, like I, I, I'm a pro probably a podcast I'll do. You know, if if you or somebody else doesn't do it in the meantime, um, you know, I, I would like a virologist on to defend it against a virologist who 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 would uh, criticize it. Forget about just the gain of function research. I don't even understand virus hunting at this point. Mm -hmm. It's like I don't know. I don't even know why you need to go into a cave to find this next vi virus that could be circulating among bats that may jump zoonotically to us. Why do that when we can make when we when we can sequence in a day and and make vaccines in a, in a weekend? I mean, like yeah. like what well, what kind of surprising. head start do you think you're getting? That's I think the point I didn't make uh, about. Brett's style of engaging this issue is people are using the fact that he was early on lab leak to suggest that he was right about ivermectin and about mRNA v vaccines and all the rest. Like, no, that, that that's, none of that connects. And it was possible to be falsely confident. Like you shouldn't have been confident about lab. No one should have been confident about lab leak early, even if it turns out to be lab leak, right? It was always plausible. 
It was never definite. It still isn't definite. Zoonotic is 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 also quite plausible. It, it certainly was super plausible then. Um, both are politically uh, uncomfortable. Uh, both were, both at the time were inflammatory to be banging on about when we were trying to secure some kind of cooperation from the Chinese, right? So there's a time for these things, and 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 it's possible to be right by accident, right? That's the th- that is. It ma- your your reasoning the style of reasoning matters wh- whether you're right or not you know it's like because your style of reasoning is dictating what you're going to do on the next topic but you, I don't had, know you, what had, to think. you had the CEO of Pfizer on your podcast did you leave that conversation feeling like this is a person who is consciously uh reaping windfall profits on a dangerous uh, vaccine uh, and putting everyone at intolerable risk? Or do you think this person, did you think this person was was making a good faith attempt to save lives uh, and had no, no bad, no no, uh, taint of bad incentives or something? Uh What's the alternative? I mean, I, I totally get right, that's, that windfall that's profits at a time of of you know, a public health emergency yeah. looks bad. It's a bad. It is a bad look, right? Yeah. But yeah. what do? How do we reward and return capital to 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 risk takers who are who will spend a billion dollars to design a new drug for a disease that may, maybe only harms of you know a single digit percentage of the population it's like well what do we want to encourage and wh- and who do we want to get rich i mean so like the person who cures cancer do we want that person to get rich or not we, we want the we want the person who uh gave us the iphone to get rich but we don't want the person who who cures cancer to get rich i mean what what are we yeah i i, I worry about all that but i i also do think that most of the people going into those fields and most of the people yes. going into government yeah. they want to do are good doing it for good and they're non psychopaths trying to get good things done and trying trying to solve hard problems and they they're not trying to get rich i mean many of the people are it's like they're bad, I mean, bad incentives are are something again i've i've, I've uttered that phrase 30 times uh, yeah. on this podcast but it's it's just almost everywhere it explains normal people creating terrible harm right it's, it's not that there are that many bad people you know and uh yes it makes it makes the truly bad people that much more remarkable and, and worth paying attention to but the bad incentives and, and the bad and the and the the uh, the power of bad ideas do do much more harm because i mean that's what that what that's what gets good people running in the wrong direction or or um doing things that are that are clearly creating unnecessary suffering. Well, I, you know, I had a lot of fun with Elon. I, I like Elon a lot. I mean, Elon, I, I knew as a friend, I, I like a lot. And, um, uh, you know, obvi- you know, it's, it's not going to surprise anyone. I mean, he's, he's, done and he's uh, continuing to do amazing things and i think he's um uh you know i think it, uh, if many of his aspirations are realized the world will be a much better place i think it's it's just it's amazing to see what he's built and what he's attempted to build and what he may yet build and so with tesla with spacex with yeah no i'm, I'm a fan of almost all of that i mean there are there are wrinkles to to a lot of that you know or some of that um all and humans are full of wrinkles. There's something very Trumpian about how he's acting on Twitter. Right? I mean, Twitter. I think Twitter's. He doesn't. He thinks Twitter's great. He bought the place because he thinks it's so great. I think Twitter's driving him crazy. Right. I think he's. I think he's needlessly complicating his life and harming his reputation and creating a lot of noise and and harming a lot of other people. I mean, so like he. The thing that I objected to with him on Twitter is not that he bought it and made changes to it. I mean, that was not. I, I, again, I, I, I remain agnostic as to whether or not he can improve the platform. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
um, it was how he was personally behaving on Twitter, not just toward me, but toward the world. I think when you, you know, forward an article about Nancy Pelosi's husband being attacked, not as he was by some lunatic, but that it's just some gay, gay tryst gone awry, right? That's not what it seems. And you link to a a website that previously claimed that uh, Hillary Clinton was dead and that a body double was campaigning in her place, that thing was exploding in Trumpistan as a conspiracy theory, right? And it was having its effect. And it matters that he was signal boosting it in front of 130 million people. And so it is with saying that your, you know, your your former employee, Yoel Roth, is a pedophile, right? I mean, it's like that has real consequences. It appeared to be complete bullshit. And now you get, this guy's getting inundated with death threats, right? And Elon, it's, all that's totally predictable, mm-hmm. right? It, it, and he's, so he's behaving quite recklessly. And there's a long list of things like, like that that he's done on Twitter. It's not ethical. It's not good for him. It's not good for the world. It's not serious. It's just, it's, it's, it's a very adolescent relationship to real problems in our society. And so my my problem with how he's behaved is that he's he's purported to touch real issues by turns like okay, do I give the satellites to Ukraine or not? Do I do I minimize their use of them or not? Is this should I publicly worry about World War 3 or not, right? He's doing this shit on Twitter, right? And uh at the same moment he's doing these other very uh, impulsive, ill-considered things, and he's not showing any willingness to really clean up the mess he makes. Um, he brings Kanye on, knowing he's an anti-Semite who's got mental health problems, and then kicks him off for a swastika, which I probably wouldn't have kicked him off for a swastika. It's like that's that's even like, can you really kick people off for swastikas? Is that something that you you, you get banned for? T- I mean, that are you a free speech absolutist if you can't let a swastika show up? I'm not even sure that's enforce- an enforceable terms of service, right? There's there are way there are moments to use swastikas that are not conveying hate and not raising the risk of violence. Clip that. Yeah. Any, <laughs> but so much of what he's doing, given that he's again scale matters, he's doing this in front of 130 million people. That's very different than a million people, and that's very different than a hundred thousand people. And so, and so when I went off the tracks with Elon, he was doing this about COVID, and. Um, Again, this was a situation where I tried to privately mitigate a friend's behavior, and it didn't work out very well. Well, no, but it, it was it was totally coming from a place of love because I was concerned about his reputation. I was concerned about what sure. he... I mean, uh, there was a twofold concern. I could see what was happening with the tweet. I mean, he he had this original tweet that was, uh, I think it was... Panic, panic over COVID is dumb, or something like that, right? Mm-hmm. This is way. This is in March. This is early March, uh, twenty twenty. Oh, right? super early days. Super of early. So when nobody knew anything, but we knew we saw what was happening in Italy, right? It was totally kicking off. Um, God, that was a wild time. That's when the toilet wild. paper it was totally wild. But that became the most influential tweet on Twitter for that week. I mean, it had more engagement than any other tweet. More than any crazy thing Trump was tweeting. I mean, it was it went off uh, again. It was, a, it was just a, a nuclear bomb of of um, information, and I could see that people were responding to it. Like, wait a minute, okay, here's this genius technologist who must have inside information about everything, right? Surely he knows something that is not on the surface about this pandemic, and they're reading. They were reading into it a lot of information that. I knew wasn't there, right? And I and I, at, the, at the time I didn't even I didn't think he had any reason to be suggesting that. I think he was just firing off a tweet, right? So I reached out to him in private, and I mean because it was a private text conversation, um, I, I'm, I won't talk about the details. But I'm just saying, in, that's a case, you know, among the many, the many cases of friends who have public platforms and who did something that I thought was dangerous and ill considered. This was a case where I I reached out in private and tried to to um, help uh, genuinely help because it was just it, I it, I thought it was harmful in in every sense 
because it was being misinterpreted. And it's like, oh, okay, you can say that panic over anything is dumb, fine. But this was not the, the, how this was landing. This was like non-issue, conspiracy, co- there's going to be no COVID in the US. It's going to peter out. It's just going to become a cold. I mean, that that's how this was getting received. Whereas at that moment, it was absolutely obvious how big a deal this was going to be, or that it was going to, at minimum, going to be a big deal. Yeah, we didn't know, but it was, there was no way we weren't going to have tens of thousands of deaths at a minimum at that point. And, and it was, there was every, it was totally rational to be worried about hundreds of thousands. And when Nicholas Christakis came on my podcast very early, you know, he predicted quite confidently that we would have about a million people dead in the U.S., right? And that didn't seem, you know, it was, it was, you know, I think appropriately hedged, but I mean, it was still, it was just like, okay, it's just going to, you just look at the, you, we were just kind of riding this exponential and we're, and it's going to be, you know, it'd be very surprising not to have that order of magnitude and mm-hmm. not something much, much less. Um, and so anyway, I mean, to, again, to, to close the, the story on Elon, um, I could see how this was being received, and uh, I tried to get him to walk that back. And then we we had a fairly long and detailed uh, exchange on this issue, and that so that intervention didn't work. And it was not done. You know, I was not an asshole. I was not. I was just concerned. You know, for him, for the world, for and you know. Um, and then there are other relationships where I didn't take the, uh, again, that's an example where taking the time didn't work right privately. Um, there are other relationships where I thought, okay, this is just going to be more trouble than it's worth. And I said, I just, just ignored it, you know, and there's a lot of that. And I, and I, Frank, again, I'm not comfortable with how this is all netted out because Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know if. You know, and I'm not, you know, frankly, I'm not comfortable with how much time in this conversation we've spent talking about these specific people. Like, what good is it for me to to talk about Elon or Brett or any? Yeah, but the issue was that at that, so at the moment I had this collision yeah. with Elon, certain things were not debatable, right? It was just, it was absolutely clear where this was going it wasn't clear how far it was going to go or how quickly we would mitigate it, but it was absolutely clear that it was going to be an issue, right? The, 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 the train had come off the tracks in Italy. We knew we weren't going to seal our borders. There were already people, you know, who there are, there are already cases known to many of us personally in the U S at that point. Um, and, he was operating by a very different logic that I couldn't engage with. Uh, yeah, but no, but where things broke down was not at the point of, oh, there's a lot to talk about, a lot to debate, this is all very interesting, and who knows what's what. It broke down very early at, this is, you know, we, there's nothing to talk about here. Like, it, like, it's like either there's a water bottle on the table or there isn't. Right, like it was. This is difficult because this is we had an exchange in private, and I want to sure, um, sure, sure. I want to honor not not uh, exposing the, the details of it, but um, you know the details convinced me that there was not a follow up conversation on that topic. Yeah, and, and Elon like... was very formative in my taking that issue seriously. I mean, he he and I went to that initial uh, conference in Puerto Rico together, and it was only because he was going, and I found out about it through him, and I just wrote his coattails to it. You know that I that I got to dropped in that side of the pool uh, to hear about these concerns at that point. <laughs> My concern about AGI is unchanged, and so I, I did a. I've, I've spoken about it a bunch on my podcast, but I, you know, I did a TED talk in 2016, which was the the kind of summary of 
what that conference and and you know various conversations I had after that did to my my brain on on this topic. Um, well, yeah, unless we find some way of permanently tethering a a self a a, a super intelligent super intelligent self improving AI to our value system. And I, you know, I, I don't believe anyone has figured out how to do that or whether that's even possible in principle. I mean, I know people like Stuart Russell, who I just had on my podcast, um, are. Oh, really? Trying, you haven't re- have you released it yet? I haven't released it yet. Yeah. Oh, great. He, he's that's been on great. previous podcasts, but it, we just recorded this week. Because uh, you haven't done an AI podcast in a while. So yeah, it's great. Yeah. It's great. So I just he's a good it. person to talk about yeah. alignment with. Yeah. So Stuart, I mean, Stuart is, has been probably more than anyone, my guru on this topic. I mean, like you're just reading his book and, and doing, I think I've done two podcasts with him at this point. I think it's Three. called the, the Control Problem or something like uh, that. His, his, book. Is, uh, his book is Human Compatible. Human Compatible. But yeah, right. he talks about the control problem. And yeah, so I just think the, the idea that we can define a value function in advance that permanently tethers a, a self-improving, super intelligent AI to our values as we continue to discover them, refine them, extrapolate them um, in an open-ended way. I think that's a tall order. And there, I think there are many more ways, there must be many more ways of designing super intelligence that is not aligned in that way and is not ever approximating our values in that way. So I mean, Stuart's idea to put it in a, a very simple way is that he thinks you don't want to specify the value function up front. You don't. You don't want to imagine you could ever write the code in such a way as to admit of no loophole. You want to make the AI uncertain as to what human values are, and perpetually uncertain, and always trying to ameliorate that uncertainty by by hewing more and more closely to what our professed values are. So, like, just it's always interested in. Us uh, saying, "Oh no, no, that's not what we want. That's not what we intend. Stop doing that." Right? Like, no matter how smart it gets, all it wants to do is more perfectly approximate mm-hmm. human values. Now, I think there are a lot of problems with that. You know, at, at a high level, I'm not a computer scientist, so I'm sure there are many problems at a low level that I don't understand or like how to force anticipate. a human into the loop always, no matter what. There's that, and like w- what humans get a vote, and just just what ah, is sure. you know uh, what what do humans value and what is the difference between what we say we value and our revealed preferences, which, I mean, if you just, if you were a super intelligent AI that could look at humanity now, I think you could be forgiven for concluding that what we value is driving ourselves crazy with Twitter and living perpetually on the brink of nuclear war and, you know, just watching you know, hot girls in yoga pants on TikTok again and again and again. It's like, what? And you're like, saying that is not? This is this, well, this is all revealed preference. And it's, what is an AI to make of that? Right? Like, and what should it optimize? Like, so part of, this is also Stuart's observation that one of the insidious things about like the YouTube algorithm is it's not that it just caters to our preferences. It actually begins to change us in ways so as to make us more predictable. It's like it finds ways to make us a better reporter of our of our preferences uh, and to trim our preferences down so that it can can uh, further train to that signal. So the main concern is that most of the people in the field seem not to be taking intelligence seriously. Like Still. yeah as as they design more and more intelligent machines, and as they profess to want to design true AGI, they're not, again, they're, they're not spending the time that Stuart is spending trying to figure out how to do this safely, above all. They're just assuming that these, these problems are gonna solve themselves as we, as we make that final stride into the end zone, or they're saying very, you know, Pollyannish things like, you know, an AI would never form a motive to harm human. Like, why would it ever form a motive to 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 be malicious toward humanity, right? Unless we put that motive in there, right? And that's that's not the concern. The concern is that in the presence of of 
vast disparities in competence and in certainly in a condition where these the machines are improving themselves they're improving their own code they could be developing goal instrumental goals that are antithetical to our well-being without any without any intent to harm us right it's it's, it's analogous to what we do to every other species on earth i mean you and i don't consciously form the intention to harm insects on a daily basis but there are many things we could intend to do that would in fact harm insects because you know you decide to repave your driveway or whatever whatever you're doing you like you're not you're just not taking the the interests of insects into account because they're so far beneath you in terms of your cognitive horizons and the, so that the real challenge here is that if you believe that intelligence you know scales up on a continuum to toward heights that we can only dimly imagine and i think there's every reason to believe that there's no reason to believe that we're near the summit of intelligence um and you can define you know define maybe maybe there's maybe there's some forms of intelligence for which this is not true but for for many relevant forms you know like the top 100 things we care about cognitively i think there's every reason to believe that many of those things most of those things are a lot like chess or go where like once the machines get better than we are they're going to stay better than we are although they're I don't know if you caught the recent thing with Go, where where and this actually came out of Stewart's lab. One. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, one, one time a human beat a machine. And, 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 yeah, and they, go. They, they found a hack for that. But anyway, in the ultimately, it's there's going to be no looking back. And then the question is, what do you, what do we do in relate in relationship to these systems that are more competent than we are in every relevant respect? Because it will be a relationship. It's not like the people—the people who think we're just going to figure this all out, you know, without thinking about it in advance. It's just going to the solutions are just going to find themselves. Um, seem not to be taking the prospect of really creating autonomous superintelligence seriously. Like, like, what does that mean? It, it, it's every bit as independent and ungovernable ultimately as us having created i mean just imagine if we created a race of people that were 10 times smarter than all of us mm -hmm. like how would we live with those people they're 10 times smarter than us right like they begin to talk about things we don't understand they begin to want things we don't understand they begin to view us as obstacles to them to their solving those problems or gratifying those desires um, we become the chickens or the monkeys in, in their presence. And I think that it's, but for some amazing solution of the sort that Stuart is, is imagining, that we could somehow anchor their reward function permanently, no matter how intelligence scales, I think um, it's, it's really worth worrying about this. I do, I do, th I do buy the, the you know, the sci-fi, uh, notion that this is a, an existential risk if we don't do it well. Well, I, I think that's true even before, far before superintelligence, right. even before general intelligence. I mean, I, I think just the narrow intelligence of these algorithms and of what ch something like, you know, chat GPT can, can do, um, I mean, it's just far short of it developing its own goals and that, that is that are at cross purposes with ours. Just the just the unintended consequences of of using it in the ways we are going to be incentivized to use it, and and you know the the money to be made from okay. scaling this thing, and what it does to to our information space and our sense of of just being able to get to ground truth of of uh, on any facts it's um yeah it's it's super scary and it was it's actually i have no intuitions on that front apart from the fact that if we continue to make progress it will come right so it's just you just have to assume we continue to make progress there's only two assumptions you you, you have to assume substrate independence 
So there's there's no reason why this can't be done in silico. It's just it's it's just we can build arbitrarily intelligent machines. There's nothing magical about having a, having this done in in the wetware of our own brains. I think that is true, and I think that's a, you know scientifically parsimonious to think that that's true. Um, and then you just have to assume we're going to keep making progress. It doesn't have to be any special rate of progress. It doesn't have to be Moore's law. It can just be we just keep going. At a certain point, we're going to be in relationship to minds uh, leaving consciousness consciousness aside. I, I don't I don't have any reason to believe that they'll necessarily be conscious by virtue of being super intelligent, and that's its own interesting ethical question. But uh, leaving consciousness aside, they're going to be more they're going to be more competent than we are, and then that's like, you know, the, the aliens have landed, you know, that's literally, that's an encounter with, again, leaving aside the possibility that, that, that something like Stuart's path is, 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 uh, actually available to us. Uh, but it, it is hard to picture if what we mean by intelligence, all things considered, and it's truly general, um, if that scales and, you know, begins to build upon itself, how you maintain that perfect, slavish devotion until the end of time. Right. So I, so I have no, you know, uh, you know, as you know, I'm not a computer scientist, so I have no intuitions about just algorithmically how you would approach that and, and what's... So From what I, what I glean from again from people who know much more about this than I do, I I think we have reason to be skeptical that these tech, techniques of you know, deep learning are actually going to be sufficient to push us into AGI, right? So it's just not, they're not they're not generalizing in the way they need to. They're not certainly not learning like human children, and so they're they they're they're brittle in strange ways. They're there, um, it's not to say that the, the human path is the only path, you know, and uh, you know, and maybe there's we we might learn better lessons by ignoring the way brains work, but um, we know that they don't generalize and use uh, abstraction the way we do, and so um, I've got very little to say on this. I mean, he has much more to say. I think he, I think he went down. This rabbit hole further than than I did, um, which which wouldn't surprise anyone. Um, he's got much more of a taste for this sort of thing than I do. But I think we we're contacted by the same person. It wasn't clear to me who this person was or how this person got that my cell phone number. Um, they didn't seem. Uh, it didn't seem like we were getting punked. I mean, it's, the person seemed credible to me. And they were talking to you about the release of different videos on UFO. Yeah, and this this is when there was a, a flurry of activity around this. So there was like a, there was a big New Yorker article on on uh, UFOs, and there was there was uh, rumors of con congressional hearings. I think come in, and and there were the the, the videos that uh, were being debunked or not. Um, and so this person contacted both of us, I think around the same time. And I think he might've contacted Rogan or other, Eric is just the only person I've spoken to about it, I think, um, who I know was contacted. And the um, what happened is just, the person kept you know, writing a check that he didn't cash. Like he, he kept saying, okay, next week I'm gonna, you know, I understand this is sounding spooky and you know, you have no reason to really trust me, but, uh, next week I'm going to, I'm going to put you on a zoom call with people who you will recognize. And they're going to be, you know, former heads of the CIA and, you know, people, people who just, you're going to, within five seconds of being on the zoom call, you'll, you'll know this is not a hoax. And I said, great, just let me know, just send me the zoom link. Right. And I went, that happened maybe three times, you know, but it, there was just one phone conversation. And then it was just texts, you know, that's just a bunch of texts. And I think uh, Eric spent more time with this person, and I'm not, I haven't spoken to him about it. I, I know he's spoken about it publicly, but um, so I, I, you know, it's not that my bullshit detector ever 
really went off in a big way. It's just the thing never happened. And I, so I, I lost interest. Well, no, I, I was, I think many people noticed this. I mean, this, this was a, a sign of how crazy the news yeah. cycle was at that point, right? Like we had COVID and we had Trump and I forget when this, the UFO thing was really kicking off, but um, it just seemed like no one had the bandwidth to even be interested in this. It's like, yeah. I, I, I was amazed to notice in myself that I wasn't more interested in figuring out what was going on. It's mm -hmm. like, it's, it, and, and I, I considered, okay, wait a minute. It, this is, if this is true, this is the biggest story in anyone's lifetime. I mean, contact with alien intelligence is by definition, the biggest story in, in anyone's lifetime in, in human history. Um, why isn't this just totally captivating? And it, it, not only was it not totally captivating, it was just barely rising to the level of my being able to pay attention to it. And I, I view that, I mean, one as a, um, to some degree, a an understandable defense mechanism against the the the, the bogus claims that yeah. that have been made about this kind of thing in the past. Um, you know, the, the general sense is probably bullshit, or pro it probably has some explanation that is you know purely terrestrial and not surprising. And there was there's there is somebody who what's his name is it Mick West? I forget. Mm -hmm. Is it a YouTuber? Yeah, Mick West, yeah. 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 He debunks stuff. Yeah, he don't. He, I mean, I you know I, I I have since seen some of those videos. I mean, now now this is going back still at least a year, but some of those videos seem like fairly credible debunkings of some of the the optical evidence. Um, and I'm surprised we don't, haven't seen more of that. Like there was a, a fairly credulous 60 minutes piece that came out around that time, looking at some of that video. And it was the very video that he was debunking on YouTube. And, you know, his, his video only had like 50,000 views on it or whatever. Um, but again, it seemed like a fairly credible debunking. I haven't seen debunkings of his debunkings, but, uh, <laughs> Amazing thing about this AI conversation, though, is that we're talking about a circumstance where we would be designing the aliens, yeah. and they would. And there's a, every reason to believe that eventually this is going to happen. Like, so I'm not at all skeptical about the the coming reality of the aliens that we're going to build them. Yeah, uh, I don't. I haven't noticed. I mean, I, I did. Uh, I did notice when I was on, but um, yeah. Well, I, I think we have this this general problem that we can't make s certain information, even you know, uh, unequivocally certain information, emotionally salient. Like, like we, we, we respond quite readily to certain things. I mean, as we talked about, we, we respond to the, the little girl who fell down a well. I mean, that just, that gets a hundred percent of our emotional resources. Uh, but the abstract probability that of nuclear war, right? Even a high probability, even just, even an intolerable probability, even if we put it at 30%, right? You know, like, it's just like, that's. That's Russian roulette with a you know gun with three chambers, and you know it's aimed at the heads, not only your head but your kid's head and everyone's kid's head, and it's, it's just twenty four hours a day. And um, I mean, I think people who who have, this pre Ukraine, I think the people who have made it their business to you know professionally to think about the risk of nuclear war and to mitigate it, you know, people like Graham Allison or William Perry or. I mean, I think they were putting uh, like the the ongoing risk. I mean, just uh, the risk that we're going to have a a proper nuclear war at, at some point in the, the you know the next generation. People were putting it at you know something like fifty percent, right? That we're living with this sort of Damocles over our heads. Now you might wonder whether anyone can have reliable intuitions about the probability of that kind of thing, but. The, the status quo is truly alarming. I mean, we've got, you know, 
we've got ICBMs on. I mean, leave aside smaller exchanges and you know tactical nukes and how that could how we could have a world war, you know, based on you know incremental changes. We've got the biggest bombs aimed at the biggest cities in both directions, and it's old technology, right? And it's you know, and it's vulnerable to some lunatic deciding to launch or or misreading, you know, bad data. And we know we've been saved from nuclear war, uh, I think at least twice by, you know, Soviet submarine commanders deciding, I'm not going to pass this up the chain of, chain of command, right? It's like, this is... It, it, um, this is almost certainly an error, and it turns out it was an error. And it's like, like, and we we need people to. I mean, in that particular case, like he saw, I think it was five, what seemed like five missiles launched from the U.S. to Russia, and he, he reasoned if the if America was going to engage in a first strike, they'd launch more than five missiles, right? So this so this has to be fictional. And then he waited long enough to decide that it was fictional, but. The probability of, of a nuclear war happening by mistake or in s- some other species of um, I- inadvertence, you know, misunderstanding, uh, a technical malfunction, that's intolerable. Forget about the, the intentional use of it by, by people who are, you know, driven crazy by some ideology. Uh, and more and more technologies are ena- enable a kind of scale of destruction. And misinformation plays into this picture in a way that is especially scary. I mean, the, we, once you can get a deep fake of, you know, the, any current president of the, the United States claiming to have launched a first strike, you know, and just, you know, send that everywhere. <laughs> Might have AI and and digital watermarks that help us. I mean, maybe we'll not trust any information that hasn't come through uh, specific channels, right? I mean, so like in in my world, it's like I I no longer feel the the need to res, you know respond to anything other than what I put out in in my channels of information it's like there's there's so much there are so many people who have clipped stuff of me that shows the opposite of what I was actually saying in context yeah. I mean the people have like re-edited my podcast audio to, to make it seem like I said the opposite of what I was saying it's like unless I put it out you know you can't be sure that I actually said it you know I mean it's it's just uh but I don't know what it's like to live like that for all in, forms of information. And uh, I mean, strangely, I think it may require a a greater siloing of information in the end. You know, it's like it, it, it it's, uh, we're living through this sort of wild west period where everyone's got a newsletter and everyone's got a blog and everyone's got an opinion. But once you can fake everything... <laughs> Yeah, or just or just knowing that you know it, it's going to be an arms race to authenticate information. So it's like if if you can never trust a photograph, yeah, unless it has been vetted by Getty Images, because only Getty Images has the resources to to authenticate the provenance of that photograph, and and attest that it hasn't been meddled with by AI. Um, and again, I don't even know if that's technically possible. I mean, maybe the, whatever the tools available for this will be, you know, commodified and, and the, the cost will be driven to zero so quickly that everyone will be able to do it. You know, it could be like encryption, but. Yeah, well, I, I think I have a pretty Uh-oh. humbling picture of that. I mean, so, cause we're still going to be the apes that we are. So we, when you, when you imagine colonizing Mars, you have to imagine a first fist fight on Mars. Yeah. You have to imagine a first murder on Mars. Also infidelity. Yeah. Somebody the extramarital affairs on Mars. Right. So it's it's gonna get uh really homely and boring really fast, I think. You know, it's like only the spacesuits or what uh, the other uh exigencies of, of just living in that atmosphere or lack thereof uh will limit how badly we can behave on Mars. 
I think we're going to experience a pendulum swing back into the real world. I mean, I think many of us are experiencing that now anyway. I mean, just, just wanting to have face-to-face encounters and spend less time on our phones and less time online. I mean, I, th- I think, uh, you know, uh, maybe everyone isn't going in that direction, but I do notice it myself. And I notice, I mean, well, once I got off Twitter, I, then I noticed the people who were never on Twitter, right? And, then, <laughs> and, and the people who were never, uh, basically, I mean, I know I have a lot of friends who are never on Twitter. Yeah. They, and they actually never understood what I was doing on Twitter. It's like, like they just like, it, it, it wasn't that they were seeing it and then reacting to it. They just didn't know. It's like, it's like being on, it's like I'm not on Reddit either, but I don't spend any time thinking about not being on Reddit, right? It's like, I just, I'm just not on Reddit. Um, well, I, I think all we have is our attention in the end. And we, we just have to notice what these various tools are doing to it. And it's just, it became very clear to me that it was an unrewarding use of my attention. Now, it's not to say there isn't some digital platform that's conceivable that would be useful but um, and rewarding, but yeah, I mean, we, we just have... You know, our life is doled out to us in moments, and we and we have, and we're continually solving this riddle of what is going to suffice to make this moment engaging and meaningful and aligned with who I want to be now and how I want the future to to look. Right? Where I, I mean, uh, that we have this tension between being in the present and becoming in the future, and. Um, you know, it's a seeming paradox. Again, it's not really a paradox, but it can seem like I do think the ground truth for personal well-being is to find a mode of being where you can pay attention to the present moment. And this is, you know, meditation by another name. You can pay attention to the present moment with sufficient, you know, gravity that you recognize that that just consciousness itself in the present moment, no matter what's happening, is already a circumstance of freedom and and contentment and and tranquility. Like you can be happy now before anything happens, mm-hmm. like before this next desire gets gratified, before this next problem gets solved. There's a, there's this kind of ground truth that that you're free, that consciousness is free and open and unencumbered by really any problem until you get lost in thought about all the problems that may yet be real for you. So the ability to catch and observe consciousness, that in itself is a source of happiness. Yeah, without being lost in thought. And, and so what, what this, hap- this happens haphazardly for people who don't meditate because they find something in their life that's so captivating, it's so pleasurable, it's so uh, thrilling. It, it can even be scary, but it can be... Even being scared is captivated. Like so, so it gets it's, it gets their attention, right? Whatever it is, if like you know, Sebastian Younger, or, you know, was wrote a great book about people's experience in war. Here, you know, it's like like it, it can be, strangely it can be the best experience anyone's ever had because everything it's like only the moment matters, right? Like the, the bullet is whizzing by your head, you're not thinking about your your four hundred one k or that thing that you didn't say last week to the person you shouldn't have been talking about. You're not thinking about Twitter. It's like you're just fully immersed in the present moment. Um, meditation is the only way. I mean, the, 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 that word can mean many things to many people. But w- what I mean by meditation is simply the discovery that there is a a a way to engage the present moment directly, regardless of what's happening. You don't need to be in a war. You don't need to be having sex. You don't need to be on drugs. You don't need to be surfing. You don't need nothing. It doesn't have to be a peak experience. It can be completely ordinary, but you can recognize that in some basic sense, there's only this and and everything else is something you're thinking. You're thinking about the past. You're thinking about the future. And thoughts themselves have no substance, right? It's, it's, it's fundamentally mysterious that any thought ever really commandeers your sense of who you are and and makes you anxious or afraid or or angry or whatever it is. Um, 
And the more you discover that, the half-life of all these negative emotions that blow all of us around get much, much shorter, right? And you can you can literally just, you know, the, the anger that would have kept you angry for hours or days lasts, you know, four seconds because you just, the moment it arises, you recognize it and you can get off there. You can decide, at minimum, you can decide whether it's useful to, to stay angry at that moment. And, you know, obviously it usually isn't. And the illusion of free will is one of those thoughts. Yeah, it's all just happening, right? Like even the mindful and meditative response to this is just happening and happening. It's just like even the moments where you recognize or not recognize is just happening. It's not that there, that, that, this does open up a degree of freedom for a person, but it's not a freedom that gives any motivation to the notion of free will. It's just a new way of being in the world. <music> Well, it, it's always I, I, it's always obvious to me when I pay attention. I mean, when, when I, whenever I'm mindful, this is the, the, the term of jargon, you know, in the Buddhist and and increasingly, you know, outside the Buddhist context, is is mindfulness, right? But there are sort of different levels of mindfulness, and there's there's different um, degrees of insight into this. But yes, yeah, so, I mean, what I'm calling evidence of lack of free will and lack of, you know lack of the self, I mean, like a two sides of the same coin. There's a sense of being a subject in the middle of experience to whom re all experience refers, mm -hmm. the sense of I, the sense of me. And that's almost everybody's starting point when they, they start to meditate. And it's, that's almost always the place people live most of their lives from. I do think that gets interrupted in ways that get unrecognized. I think people are constantly losing the sense of I, they're losing the sense of subject object distance, but they're not recognizing it. And and meditation is the mode in which you can recognize. You can you can both consciously precipitate it, you can look for the self and fail to find it and then recognize its absence. And that's the just the flip side of the coin of free will. I mean the 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 feeling of having free will is what it feels like to feel like a self who's thinking his thoughts and doing his actions and intending his intentions. And he, the, the man in the middle of the boat who's rowing, um, that's the start, that's the false starting point. When you find that there's no one in the middle of the boat, right? Or in fact, there's no boat, there's just the river, there's just the flow of experience and there's no center to it. And there's no place from which you would control it. Again, even when you're doing things, you, this does not negate the difference between voluntary and involuntary behavior. It's like, I can voluntarily reach for this, but when I'm paying attention, I'm aware that everything is just happening. Like just mm -hmm. the intention to move is just arising, right? And I'm in no position to know why it didn't ar arise a moment before or a moment later or a moment, or, or, or you know, 50% stronger or weaker, or, you know, so as to be ineffective or, or to be doubly effective, sort of where I lurched for it versus I move slow. I mean, not, I'm, I'm not, I, I can never run the counterfactuals. I can never, I mean, all, all of this opens the door to a, a, an even more disconcerting picture along the same lines, which is, subsumes this conversation about free will. And it's the question of whether anything is ever possible. Like what if, this is a question, I, I haven't thought a lot of about it, but it's been a few years I've been kicking this question around. Um, so I mean, what if only the actual is possible? What if, what if there was, what if, was, so we live with this feeling of possibility. We live with the sense that let me take, so, you know, I have, two daughters, I could have had a third child, right? So what does it mean to say that I could have had a third child? Or is it, do you, you don't have kids, I don't think. No. So Not that I know of. Yes. So but the possibility might be right. there. So what do we mean when we say you could have had a child or you might, you, you might have a child in the future? Like what, what, what is the space in reality? What's the relationship between possibility and actuality and reality? Is there a reality in which non-actual things are nonetheless real? And 
so there, we have other categories of like non concrete things. We have things that don't have spatial temporal dimension, but they're nonetheless, they, they, they nonetheless exist. So like, you know, in the integers, right? So numbers, there's a, there's a reality, there's an abstract reality to numbers. And this is, it's philosophically interesting to think about these things. So they're not like, in some sense, they're, they're, they're real and they're dis- they're not, not merely invented by us they're discovered because they have structure that we can't impose upon them right it's not like they're not fictional characters like you know i mean hamlet and, and superman also exist in some sense but they exist at the level of of our own fiction and and abstraction but it's like they're true they're true and false statements you can make about hamlet they're true and false statements you can make about superman because our fiction, the fictional worlds we've created have a certain kind of structure. But again, this is all abstract. It's it, like it's all abstractable from any of its concrete instantiations. It's not just in the comic books and just in the movies. It's in our, you know, ongoing ideas about these characters. But na- natural numbers or, or um, the integers don't function quite that way. I mean, they're similar, but they also have a structure that's purely a matter of discovery. It's not, you can't just make up whether numbers are prime. You know, if you give me two integers, you know, of, of a certain size, two, let's say you, you mentioned two enormous integers. If I were to say, okay, well, between those two integers, there are exactly 11 prime numbers, right? That's a very specific claim about which I can be right or wrong. And whether or not anyone knows I'm right or wrong. It's like, that's just there's a domain of facts there, but these are abstract, it's an abstract reality that relates in some way that's philosophically interesting, you know, metaphysically interesting to what we call real reality, you know, this, the spatial temporal order, the physics of things. But possibility, at least in my view, occupies a different space. And, and this is something, again, I my thoughts on this are pretty inchoate, and I, I, th- I think I need to talk to a philosopher of physics and and or a physicist about how this may interact with with things like the many worlds interpretation of quantum yeah, like mechanics. So. But even that that's just more actuality. So if if I took that seriously, ah, uh, sure, <laughs> that's that's a case of and and truth is that happens even even if the, the many worlds interpretation isn't true, but we just imagine we have a physically infinite universe. The implication of infinity is such that things will begin to repeat themselves. Yeah. You know, the farther you go in space, right? So, the, you know, if, if you just head out in one direction, eventually you're going to meet two people just like us having a conversation just like this, and you're going to meet them an infinite number of times in every you know infinite var- variety of permutations, slightly different from this conversation, right? So, I mean, infinity is just so big that our intuitions of probability completely break down. But what I'm suggesting is maybe probability isn't a thing right maybe there's only actuality if there's o- maybe there's only what happens and at every point along the way our notion of what could have happened or what might have happened is just that it's just a thought about what could have happened or might have been. yeah and and possibility itself is a kind of spooky idea because it it too has a sort of structure Right, so like if I if I'm going to say, you know, you could have had a daughter, right, last year. Um, so we're saying that's that's possible, but not actual, right? That is a claim. Of, there, there are things that are true and not true about that daughter, right? Like it, it has a kind of structure. It's like but what does it mean so like what does it mean if if we say you know i just did that but i I, it's conceivable that i wouldn't have done that right like it's possible that i i just threw this cap but i might not have done that so you're taking it very temporally close to the original like what would appear as a decision whenever we're saying something's possible but not actual right like this thing just happened but it's conceive it's it's possible that it wouldn't have happened or that it would have happened differently in what does that possibility 
consist? Like, where is that? What is yeah. for that to be real? For the possibility to be real, what are we? What claim are we making about the universe? Well, isn't that an extension of the idea that free will is an illusion? That all we have is actuality? That the possibility is an right? Illusion? I, yeah, I'm just extending it beyond is there human action. Ah, uh, like it's, it's, okay. it, this goes to the physics of things. This is just everything. Like we're we're, we're always telling ourselves a story. Yeah. That includes possibility. Possibility is really compelling for some reason. <laughs> well, yeah, well, because it's it's. I mean, so this, yeah, I mean, this could sound just academic, but it, every backward-looking regret or disappointment, and every forward-looking worry, is completely dependent on this notion of possibility. Like every regret is based on the sense that something else, I could have done something else. Something else could have happened. Every disposition to worry about the future is based on the feeling that there's this range of possibilities. It could go either way. And, you know, I mean, I, I know whether, whether or not there's such a thing as possibility, you know, I'm convinced that worry is almost never uh, psychologically appropriate because the reality is that in any given moment, Either you can do something to solve the problem you're worried about or not. So if you can do something, just do it, you know, and if you can't, your worrying is just causing you to suffer twice over, right? You're going to, you know, you're going to, you're going to get the medical procedure next week anyway. How much time between now and next week do you want to spend worrying about it, right? It's, it's going to, it's the worry, the worry doesn't accomplish anything. How much do physicists think about possibility? Well, they think about it in terms of probability more often, but probability just describes and again, this is a place where I'm, I might be out of my depth and need to talk to somebody to to uh, debunk this. But the <laughs> um, do therapy with a physicist. Yeah, um, but probability it seems just describes a pattern of actuality that we've observed, right? I mean, we have there are certain things we observe, and those are the actual things that have happened, and we have this additional story about probability. I mean, we have the frequency with which things happen have happened in the past. Um, you know, I, I can flip a fair coin and know, I know in the abstract that I have a belief that in the limit that those flips, you know, those tosses should converge on 50% heads and 50% tails. I know I have a story as to why it's not going to be exactly 50% within any arbitrary time frame. Um, but in reality, all we ever have are the observed tosses. Right. And then we have an additional story that, oh, it came up heads, but it could have come up tails. Why do we think that about that last toss? What, and, and, and what are we claiming is true about the physics of things if we say it could have been otherwise? About the world. Yeah. It seems that possibility has to be somewhere to be effective. It's a little, it's a little bit like what's what's happening with the laws of. There's something metaphysically interesting about the laws of nature too, because the laws of nature. So the laws of nature impose their their work on the world, right? We see their evidence, but they're not reducible to any specific set of instances, right? So there's some structure there, but the structure isn't just a matter of the actual things. We have the actual billiard balls that are banging into each other. All of that actuality can be explained by what actual things are actually doing. But then we have this notion that in addition to that, we have the laws of nature that are making, that are explaining this act. But, it, but how are the laws of nature an additional thing in addition to just the actual things that are actually affect costly? And if, if, they're, if they are an additional thing, in, how are they effective? If not, they're not among the actual things that are just actually banging around. Yeah. And so it, to some I degree- see. For that, possi possibly has to be hiding somewhere for the laws of nature to, to be, be possible. <laughs> like, to, for, yeah, for anything to be possible, it has to be- It has it's to have- a closet somewhere, I'm sure. It's the, where all the possibility goes. It has to be attached to something. So- I mean, You don't think many worlds is that. It, yeah. Because well, many worlds it still exist. Well, because we're in this strand of that multiverse. Yeah. Right. So it's still, still, you have just the local instance of what is actual. Yeah. And then if it proliferates elsewhere where you can't be affected by it, many worlds more says actuality. you can't really connect with the other. 
Yeah. Yeah. And so many worlds are just a statement of basically everything that can happen happens somewhere. Right? That's, yeah. You know, and that's, I mean, maybe that's not an entirely kosher formulation of it, but it, it seems pretty close. So, so, but there's whatever happens, right? In fact, there's, you know, relativistically, there's a, there's an, you know, the, the Einstein's original notion of a block universe seems to suggest this. And I, it's been a while since I've been in a conversation with a physicist where I've gotten a chance to ask about the standing of this concept in physics currently. I don't, I don't hear it discussed much, but the idea of a block universe is that, you know, space time exists as an, a totality. And our sense that we are traveling through space time, where there's a, a real difference between the past and the future, that that's an illusion of just our, you know, you know, weird the weird the weird slice we're taking of of this larger object. But on some level, it's like you know you're reading a novel. The, the last page of the novel exists just as much as the first page when you're in the middle of it. And they're just, you know, if that's if we're living in anything like that, then there's no such thing as possibility. I I would it would seem there's just what is actual. So, as a matter of our experience, moment to moment, I think it's totally compatible with that being true, that there is only what is actual. And that sounds, to the the naive ear, that sounds like it would be depressing and disempowering and confining, but as anything but, it's actually, it's a circumstance of pure discovery. Like, you have no idea what's going to happen next. Right? You don't know who you're going to be tomorrow. You're only by tendency seeming to resemble yourself from yesterday. I mean, there's there's way more freedom in all of that than than it's you know, it seems true to many people. And yet, the basic insight is that you're not you're not in the the, the real freedom is is the recognition that you're not in control of anything. Everything is just happening. Including your thoughts and intentions and moods. So life is the is a, is a process of continuous discovery. Yeah, you're part of the universe. Yeah, you are. You are just this. I mean, it's it's the miracle that the the universe is illuminated to itself as itself where you sit, and you're mm-hmm. and you're continually discovering what your life is, and then you're you have this layer at which you're telling yourself a story that you already know what your life is. And you know exactly, you know who you should be, and what's you know what's about to happen, or you're struggling to form a confident opinion about all of that. And yet, there is this this fundamental mystery to everything, even the most familiar experience. We're all NPCs in in a most marvelous video game. Maybe, although my my game my sense of gaming is does not run as deep as to know what I'm committing to there. A, a you, non, it's a non playing character. Are you yeah. more, yeah, not yeah. playing. Oh wow, yeah. yes, yeah. you're more you're more of a Mario Kart guy. Yeah, I, yeah. Tell. I went back. I was an, an original video gamer, but it's been a long time since I. <laughs> I mean, I was I was there for Pong. <laughs> I remember when I saw the, the first Pong in a restaurant in. Uh, I think it was like Benny Hanna's or something. They had a Pong and a uh, table, and that was. <laughs> Well, I mean, once or twice a year, I will play a round of golf, which uh, many people would find embarrassing. Uh, they might even find my play embarrassing, but uh, it's Do fun. you find it embarrassing? No, I mean, I, I love, uh, golf just takes way too much time, so I can only squander a certain amount of time on it. I, I, I do love it. It's, it's a lot of fun. Well, you but, have no control over your actual performance. You, you're you're no, I, ever no, I, discovering. I, I, I do I do have, uh, I have, I have control over my mediocre performance, but it's uh, I don't have enough control as to make it really good. But happily, I don't. I I'm in the perfect spot because I don't invest enough time in it to care how I play. So I just have fun when I play. Well, it comes back to a few of the things we've talked about. I, mean, I, I think I'm I'm hopeful. That, I, I know that most people are good and are mostly converging on the same core values, right? It's like we're we're not surrounded by psychopaths and i um the the thing that finally convinced me to to get off twitter was how different life was seeming through the lens of twitter it's like i, I just got the sense that there's way, there are way more psychopaths or effective psychopaths than i realized and then i thought okay that's 
this isn't real. This is this is either a, a strange context in which actually decent people are behaving like psychopaths, uh, or it's um, you know it's a bot army or something that I don't have to take seriously. So yeah, I just think most people, if we can get the if we can get the incentives right, I think there's no reason why we can't really thrive collectively. Like so, th- there's enough wealth to go around. There's enough, uh, you know, th- there's no, there's no effective limit, you know, I mean, again, within the limits of what's physically possible, but we're, n- we're nowhere near the limit on abundance, you know, on this, uh, forget about going to Mars on this, the one rock, right? It's like, we, we could make this place incredibly beautiful uh, and stable if we just did enough work to solve some you know you know rather uh, long standing political problems i'm worried about the asymmetries that you know it's easier to break things than to fix them it's easier to yeah. to um uh, light a fire than to put it out and uh I do worry that you know, as technology gets more and more powerful, it becomes easier for the minority who wants to screw things up to effectively screw things up for everybody. Right. So it's it's easier. It's like a, a thousand years ago, it was simply impossible for one person to derange the lives of millions, much less billions. Now that's getting to be possible. So on the assumption that we're always going to have a sufficient number of crazy individuals or, or, um, malevolent individuals. It's, it's, uh, that is, we have to figure out that asymmetry somehow. And so there's some cautious exploration of emergent technology that we need to get our, our head screwed on straight about. And so like, so gain of function research, like just how much do we want to democratize, uh, you know, all the relevant technologies there? You know, do we want really? You really want to give everyone the ability to order nucleotides in the mail and and uh, give them the blueprints for viruses online because of you know you're a free speech absolutist and you think all PDFs need to be uh, you know exportable everywhere. Um, I'm, so I'm much more. So this is where yeah. So there are limits to. I'm not, you know, many people are confused about my take on free speech because I've come down on 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 the unpopular side of some of these questions, but it's been, my overriding concern is that in, in many cases, I'm worried about the free speech of the individual businesses or individual platforms or individual you know media people to decide that they don't wanna be associated with certain things, right? So like, if, if you own Twitter, I think you should be able to kick off the Nazi you don't wanna be associated with because it's your platform, you own it, right? That's your free speech. Right, that's the side of my free speech concern for Twitter. Right, it's not that every Nazi has the right to, to be, to, to algorithmic speech on Twitter. I think if you own Twitter, you should be, you or the you know whether it's just Elon or you know in the world where it wasn't Elon, just the, the people who own Twitter, the the and the board and the shareholders and the employees. These these people need to dis- can should be free to decide what they want to promote or not. They're public. I view them as publishers more you know more than as as platforms in the end and um that has other implications but i do worry about this problem of misinformation and algorithmically and and otherwise you know supercharged misinformation and i think i do think we have we're at a bottleneck now i mean i I guess it's, it's could be the hubris of every present generation to think that their moment is especially important but i do think with the emergence of these technologies, we're some kind of bottleneck where we really have to figure out how to get this right. And if we do get this right, if we figure out how to not drive ourselves crazy by giving people access to all the all possible information and misinformation at all times, I think, yeah, we could there's no limit to how happily we could collaborate with billions of creative, fulfilled people. You know, it's just 
enjoy yourselves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't break yeah, anything, have, kids. <laughs> have a good party without me. Thanks but, so much. Uh, very very happy to do this. Thanks thanks for the invitation. Thank you. Great to see you again. Thank you. This is the Lex Free Podcast.